couple of girls talk about the sun the get familiar with blue and the charm ones too charm chats hello and welcome to charm chats with kendra and cat it's gonna be a good one i think if you say so i mean as long as your notes are more extensive than last week I'm although, hoping... although the the lack of extensivity, I'm making that a word, um, <laughs> t- was cause for some great amusement on my part. Yeah, taking notes when I'm sick is um, odd, to say the least. Yes, the least amount of the least amount of notes you could take. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sick during this one, but I did have a very very busy week. Mm-hmm. So, we'll see what happens. With Indeed. My, with my notage. So we are up to episode 217, How to Make a Quilt Out of Americans. Yeah. This one aired on April 6th, 2000. So the title is in reference to the movie How to Make an American Quilt, which is a movie from 1995. I've never seen it. I'll link it on the website, of course. But You didn't even bother including the plot either. It's It's something like... A woman gets life advice while people are making a quilt around her. I mean, it's really... So, White Joy Luck Club? Kind of? Well, that's not exactly an advice thing. It is a very good movie. If you've never seen Joy Luck Club, watch it. I mean, it's, you know, Bride to be Finn Dodd hears tales of romance and sorrow from her elders as they construct a quilt. Oh! It's a Winona Ryder movie, comedy drama romance. As you do. Yeah. It's a PG-13 movie from 1995 with Renona Ryder. Yep. You know, that actually does sound a little closer to Joy Luck Club. Yeah. I don't know why I keep referencing Joy Luck Club. I don't know why either. But, yeah. So there's that. Mm-hmm. Should we just get right into it? I mean, sure. We don't have any, any notes yes, or anything. Yes, let's get right so into this right into aerial font. Is this? Oh, yeah, I guess it is aerial, isn't it? Hey. I know my fonts. Yeah. You know... I, I'm a very aesthetically minded person. I didn't default format, so it's not all in Times New Roman. I'm sorry. I accept your apology. Okay. We start out with an exterior night shot of a very large house with stained glass windows and there's a fountain out front. It was a really, Mm -hmm. really pretty Victorian house. Yeah, like kind of an earlier era Victorian, I want to say. Yeah. Or actually it might be later. I'm not sure. I don't know where the whole like including stone into the mix comes well, in. Well, the fact that it was mostly, like, I think that, actually, neutral that might colors. Just be, that might just be, like, a price point thing. Like, the richer people could have the stone houses, and the still rich but less rich people got the pretty wooden ones with the colorful paint. Yeah. This was very much a non-colorful house. This was very much stone grays and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, but it was a very, very pretty house. Like, the circular windows and the... I love a Victorian. It's my favorite aesthetic on a house. I do love a Victorian. But for whatever reason... Actually, no, this reminded me... Because there's a history museum in my old town that looked a lot like it. Except that that house is entirely stone. There's Mm. no wood. Mm. But the look of the stone reminded me of that. Yeah, it was so I think it was pretty. just that it didn't look enough like the History Museum, and I'm like, mm, could be more stone. <laughs> that could be. <laughs> that could very well be. But I, I love a good Victorian. Like, my dream house would be Victorian on the outside and modern on the inside. Mm, yeah. That would just be amazing. We'll work on that. Yeah. I love a good Victorian. It's just so pretty. Anyway. Inside, we see three older ladies. They are standing in a circle, touching hands, chanting a spell, inviting a demon named Crito to come to them. A demon? Demon. You said demon. Did I? Yeah. Well, sure. It's now a demon. <laughs> I'll leave it. I'm not even going to edit that out. You're welcome, people. And so- there's, a, there's a lovely, like, brick arch in the background. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can tell they're they're probably in a basement of a house of this mm-hmm. house like it's and I th- I think you get a glimpse of some wooden stairs mm-hmm. like wooden frame stairs so you know you're in a basement <laughs> is that going to be our newest catchphrase now it's where you're going with that one apparently so you know you're in a dot 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 yeah nice so the the spell that they are chanting is 
We call on the demon Crito, reach back through the ages, humbled by his power. We invite him into our circle. And obviously this is not exactly a spell so much as an invocation or a summoning or whatever. Yeah. Very seancey. Yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. So we find out the names of these three lovely older ladies in this scene, so I might as well tell you about them now. We see one of them is named Gail. She has got, she got some lovely uh, short, curly, kind of whitish hair. Yeah, it's like whitish gray. She's got on a black skirt and a light purple sweater set with little flowers on it. Mm-hmm. She is played by Anne Haney. She was born in 1934, and she actually died of heart failure in 2001. I did not know she was dead. Yeah, she died a year after this was done. I think this was. I think she had like six things that came out after Charmed, mm-hmm. and then she was gone. Uh, she started acting in 1978, and she was going strong until her death. She did a lot of single episodes of TV shows, TV movies. Personally, I remember her from a show called Mama's Family. I used to watch that in the morning before school. Yeah. It was a show that starred Vicki Lawrence, and it actually started out as a sketch on the Carol Burnett show. If you have never seen it, it is a good time. Mm-hmm. It might not hold up because, you know. I, I don't think it holds up all that well. It's but slightly... I think it holds up. I think it holds up about as well as The Nanny. Yeah. It, because but it but... might be a little bit more racist, maybe. Well, yeah. Well, you know. Uh-huh. But early, um, early 80s, you know, it's a thing. Yeah. But it's still fun. It's a yeah. very funny show. I will probably link to Mama's Family, Vicki Lawrence, and The Carol Burnett Show. And if I can, I don't know if I'll be able to, but if I can, I will try to find, like, a good episode and link the YouTube for that. Yeah. Don't hold me to that. We'll see. The next person in the, our little list here is named Amanda. She has black hair, and she's wearing a black dress under a large overshirt that is covered in a leaf motif. <laughs> Say that five times fast. Leaf motif, leaf motif, leaf motif, leaf motif, leaf motif. It helps that it rhymes. Yeah. She is played by Pamela Gordon. She was born in 1937, and she died of cancer in 2003. Mm-hmm. She started acting in 1974 and was also acting up until her death. And in fact, she was actually in a stage play called Harvey when she died. And no, I don't mean she died on stage. Just putting that out there before anybody thinks that. She wasn't in very many big name movies and was only really in single episodes of like random TV shows. So, yeah. Our third and final of our our lovely older ladies is Helen. She has brownish red hair. And she is very tall. She is quite tall. She is the tallest of the group. And she is wearing a tan outfit with small little, like, purple flowers on the top. She is played by Lucky Lee Flippin, which is, like, the best name. Oh my god, I love that. I love that. And it's just great. She was born in 1943, and she is still alive. So there you go. (laughs) While her first IMDb credit is actually from 1956, her next one is in 1971, so take that for what it will be. She apparently had her first acting at 13 and then waited a few more years. (laughs) But she hasn't done anything since 2008. Her big break was in 1979 when she got the role of Eliza Jane Wilder on Little House in the Prairie. And in 1980, she was on a show called Flow. While most people know about Little House, most people have never heard of Flo. It actually only had 29 episodes over two seasons, but she was in 23 of those. Flo is a show that is about a former Arizona waitress who buys a rundown bar in Texas. It was a spinoff of a show called Alice, and Alice was a TV show based on a movie called Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Wait, wait, wait. So what? Flo is a spinoff of a spinoff? Kind of? Kind of. It was a spinoff of a show yeah. that was a... Based on a movie. Based on a movie. It's kind of a spinoff of a spinoff. Yeah. A little bit. But the best part is that our lucky Lee Flippin played a character named Fran on Flo, and then a few years later was on a single episode of Alice playing a character named Dottie. <laughs> so she went from the spinoff to the original playing a completely different character. Of course. I just think it's funny. So I'm not going to change it much more than that. But, of course, I will link to Mm -hmm. all of those things on the website. So, these lovely ladies have apparently been chanting for 15 minutes, but a la convenience, the second they restart after someone mentions that fact, 
the chanting, the invocation thing suddenly works. Yeah. And we see some CGI smoke puffing up in the middle of their little triangle circle thing. And there's it, a face in it. Yeah, and the face looks like it's being pushed up against a piece of fabric, making, like, the nose poke upward. It looks yeah. a bit silly. It looks kind of kind of like an evil person from Whoville. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, with the nose. Yeah, a little bit. It's got, like, a little smushed up uh-huh. turned nose. And the, the, the summoned smoky face is very irate and asks who summoned them and what do they want? Yeah. And they, they ask for youth, beauty, and health. Oh. Yeah. And then oh, my. He, oh, my. And then he asks what they Sorry, can... wait, no, I want to say that like George Takei. Okay. Oh, my. There you go. He asks what they can give him, and they say that they can make him whole again, but of course he wants more than that. Uh-huh. He, he says wants he wants great, great powers. powers. And then he starts to kind of fade off. And Gail's like, wait, wait. Don't tell <laughs> I me. I can give you some uh, shit. Yeah. And she mentions the power to stop time, to have things with your mind, and to see the future. Mm-hmm. And our collective, like, <laughs> spidey senses go a tingle, tingle. Yeah. Because and even though we've never seen this woman before, somehow she's like, we know I will give you talking. the charmed one's powers. Yeah, we know who she's talking about. Yeah. So he says that if they can get him those powers, then they'll get their youth. And then he disappears again. Helen's like, oh, he's going to be angry when you can't get him the power scale. Yeah, but Gail says that she yes, has to get them. Yes, her because, voice sounds like that. Yeah, it was high pitched. Gail says that she has to get them because she's not ready to die. And just before she goes up the stairs, she's like, oh, BT Dubs, finish that quilt by tomorrow night. Yes. And we're like, I wonder what this quilt is made out of. <laughs> yeah. You know, seeing as the name of the episode and all. So then we cut over to an exterior shot of the manor with a quick glimpse of the swan hitch. And there is some green foliage climbing up the trellis at the front door. Mm-hmm. And I mention this because this will become a thing <laughs> later on. Of course it will. Yes. So, we see inside a book with tiny text blurring in and out of focus. And then Phoebe, sitting on her bed, looking at said book. Yep. She is wearing black jean shorts with a red and black top that has spaghetti straps that are tied into bows at the shoulder. Yeah, they're basically like a chiffon ribbon thing. Yeah. Not chiffon, but like... Kind of a meshy... There's a word for it. Not taffeta. No, no, no. Fuck, What's the term it? for that that kind of ribbon? Like the vaguely see-through kind of ribbon that's also a bit sparkly. Yeah. I don't know what the word is because brain uh-huh. stuff. I imagine if we were at Joann's, we'd know. We'd yes. be able to look at them. But yeah, they're cute little black ribbons that are just tied in bows at the shoulders. Yeah. And the pattern on the front of the shirt looks like a butterfly. Mm-hmm. Like at first I thought it was a dragonfly, but it was like, nope, that's too, too small of a body on the yeah. thing. So it was a butterfly. Her hair is in these adorable high little pigtail things. Pigtail buns. Yeah, it was so cute. And then she's got this small little beaded necklace on. And she kind of squints her eyes while trying to read the book. And then she pulls out a pair of glasses and puts them on and kind of looks at herself in the mirror. Mm-hmm. And they were cute glasses. They little... were fucking adorable. Yeah, and, and she looked so frames. goddamn cute. Yeah. No, there were no frames. They were just like the... No, they were like... They looked I'm... like they didn't really have frames. They I'm... looked like they were just the glass in, in the... Because I think that was pretty... I'm fairly certain they were just really thin wireframes. Okay, so they're so, wireframes that attempt to look clear, so that confuses me. Yeah, they're they're like really, really thin wireframes. But it's... They're cute glasses. Like, oh, they're goddamn adorable, and they look great on her. And yeah. they're very of the era. Yeah, and like they were cuter than the glasses that I was wearing at that time, let me tell you. Oh, yeah. But she doesn't seem to like the way that they look, so she takes them back off. And then somebody knocks on the door, and so she hides them under her pillow. As Prue walks in. in. And (laughs) Prue immediately starts asking if she's gone to see the optometrist. Yeah. So Prue comes in. She's wearing a very low-cut white spaghetti strap top with a skirt that is white with, like, red roses dotted all around it. She also has a beaded necklace on, but this one is bigger beads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and as Prue asks if Phoebe has gone to see the optometrist, Phoebe's like, no, I don't need glasses. And so Prue does the really funny, adorable gag of, Turning, here, let me fix this, yeah. turns the book around because it was upside down. Yeah, which is just hilarious. Uh-huh. So Phoebe tries to play this off, 
and Prue changes the subject because she's like, okay, Phoebe doesn't want to talk about this shit, and tells Phoebe that Piper is throwing out her boots. Now, Phoebe doesn't get concerned about this until Prue mentions that they are the, the tan, tan boots. boots. Yeah. This is apparently a sign that something is truly wrong with Piper, and they both head out of the room, and we cut down to the kitchen where Piper is putting tan hiking boots into a paper bag. And the, the boots look fairly nice, except that there's this weird, like, congealed green gunk on them. Yeah, they're, it's like green, gross, mm-hmm. oozy stuff all over Yeah, it. and she is wearing a shirt that I hate. Yes, and Please this is... describe it. It is a very shiny, purple, high-neck, short-sleeve top. Mm-hmm. This is, is one of those other ones that looked like it could have come out of a can. Yeah, it is very much, it looks like those crepe shirts mm-hmm. where, like, you look at that and go, if I touch it, it'll crinkle. Well, it's already crinkled, so they beat you to it. But, like, no, 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 not not wrinkle. Crinkle. Like, if I touch it, it will make a noise. Oh, true. It'll be like, <laughs> you know, like, okay. yeah, that's, that's when you look at that shirt and go... How is that comfortable to wear? It looks like it would be very uncomfortable to wear. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we don't see her legs at this time, so we don't know what she has paired this with. I'm assuming black pants because I'm assuming black skirt. Like, it's always something black with these things. You know, like, that's Mm -hmm. that's usually her go-to is, like, black pants or dark gray pants, but whatever. We haven't seen her legs yet. I feel like whenever she wears a ponytail, she's usually wearing a skirt to go with it. Oh, that, I, I have not been paying attention to that. I don't know why I have that association. I just do. Yeah, don't know. Anyway, anyway, so apparently, supposedly, yeah, these supposedly are these are her favorite, favorite boots. boots, even though we have never seen her wearing them. And honestly, they look like something Leo would wear. Uh huh. And these are also supposedly the third pair this month that she's having to throw out because they're covered in demon blood, and she just, you know, can't take them to get clean. Mm-hmm. And she's also rather peeved because she has to go to be three to meet dan so she can fucking break up with him because even though she loves him she loves leo more yep now here's my my quick question about these boots right i understand that these are supposedly her favorites even though we've never seen her wearing them but are you really gonna throw out three pairs of boots just because they got demon gunk on them And you couldn't clean them off. And for whatever reason, she doesn't feel comfortable taking them to a place that could possibly clean them off. And that's fine. I have no problems with her not taking them to a place. But seriously, just take a fucking, like, go out into the backyard, take a fucking hose, and wash them down. Or stop getting suede boots. Well, there is that. But, like, seriously, you don't throw out a pair of boots just because they get dirty. Mm -hmm. These are work boots, too. wash them off, and then you keep wearing them. I mean... They're work boots. They're meant to get dirty. Yeah, like, I I don't know. Maybe because I'm the kind of person that I only own, like, two pairs of shoes. So. Yeah, and I can I think of. I wear them until they die. I mean, <sighs> I could think of a few excuses you could use in going to a place that could clean them off. Be like, oh, yeah, it was a Halloween thing and I just never bothered to get them cleaned. Or, like I said, just take a hose to them. Wash them down. Or just never explain. Just be like, hey, these got gunk on them. Can you clean it? And they'll be like, yeah, sure. And if they ask, they'll go, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Stepped in something. Yeah. Like, legit. Dog vomit. But legit. Dog vomit can look really fucking weird. So that would cover a, a whole range of colors. Yes. But, like, even if... I love how we're going on this lovely, like, rant about these shoes. I know. But, like, legit, like, I just don't understand why she couldn't just hose them off. Because it's just demon blood. Like, it's this green, gooey stuff, sure, but, like, it's just demon blood. Like, so you just wear those shoes when you're going to vanquish another demon. You get some more demon blood on them, you wash them off again. It's really not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. It's not like you got the gunk on the inside of them. True. So, we'll leave it there now. Anyway. So yeah. she's going to the. She has to go to the club to break up with with Dan because even though she's not really sure how the thing with Leo is going to work out. Yeah, because and he's she's not supposed to date witches, right? She laments being a witch, so you know that this is going to be a running thing. Yeah, throughout the entire episode because it's the if only I are, wasn't a witch. Are, are are you stealing my catchphrase? Possibly. <laughs> so you know this is going to be a thing. I sense a theme. Yes. She grabs her bag. She leaves out the back door. And a few moments later, the doorbell on the front door rings. And so Phoebe and Prue 
walk into the foyer. They open the door, and Gail, from our first scene, is there. And, and she they is... call her Aunt Gail, so they obviously recognize her. And they've known her for a while, and they're very excited to see her. Even though we never have. Uh-huh. And she comes in. She's wearing a red shirt under an overshirt that is covered in very large flowers and a gray skirt. Mm-hmm. And they, they say, hey, Aunt Gail, how you doing? That sort of thing. They give a big, huge hug. And then we get the opening credits. Yeah. So the DVD song is very appropriately 17 17 again again. by the Eurythmics. Yeah. So the Eurythmics is a British music duo consisting of members David A. Stewart and Annie Lennox. And that's why I recognized her voice because I didn't realize who was in the Eurythmics. I'm just like, I knew this person. Mm Mm-hmm. So most people will know the Eurythmics by the song Sweet Dreams Are Made of This, which was the title song off their second album, which was actually included in the book 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. Links on the website to all Uh of that, of course. Now, I know that that song has been redone by many, many people, including Marilyn Manson. Yeah. So honestly, I kind of like his cover. Yeah, it's not bad actually. It's well, just it's, it makes it creepy, but in like a cool way. It was already a fairly creepy, creepy song. niche eighties song. Well, not niche, but like yeah. a creepy er toned yeah eighties song. So the fact that he picked it up and brought it fully into, into the, the creepy, creepy zone, yeah, just is very appropriate. Yeah. So you watched it on DVD. Yes, I watched it on Netflix because I was. Trying to make time. This has been a very, very busy week for me. The Netflix song is a song called Like Before by a band called Junebug. Still highly appropriate. Yeah. It it worked. It was very nice, but legit. All I could find was the YouTube video for this specific song. And in the description box, it says, Junebug is made up of Sarah Ozell and Michael Shurkin. I literally couldn't find anything that linked them back to this song. I will just link to the YouTube video for this song on the website. But, like, there, when I looked up Junebug, I found, like, three different bands with that name, but none of them had this song. None of them had this album. According to Shazam, hashtag not sponsored, it was a self-titled album, but none of the bands that are called Junebug had this song. So, yeah. I don't know what to do with that. (laughs) So we just leave it there. I will link to the YouTube video because, yeah. So, our lovely shots after the opening credits. We start with a shot of the Golden Gate Bridge that seems to be taken from atop a moving train. Sure. Yeah. And then we get a shot from inside a car driving on the bridge. Then a helicopter shot of the bridge. A helicopter shot of the buildings around showing the Triangle Building. And then a shot of the Oakland Bay Bridge in the background of buildings. And we end on an exterior shot of the manor. And now, this is why I brought up the foliage from before, there is white foliage creeping up the trellis in front of the door. No, like white foliage. Like the leaves were white, the thing was white. It was just all white for some reason. Yeah. Who knows? Wedding season? I don't know. (laughs) No idea. So inside, we see Phoebe's reflection in a mirror, and then she opens the door that that mirror is attached to, and it seems to be some sort of storage cabinet of some sort. I th- I think it's it's the, the one, one in the yeah it's in, the one in the in the downstairs hall in front yeah. of the stairs. Mm-hmm. We don't know that until she like where Prue had been keeping her camera equipment the episode prior. Yes. Yeah, and there's like uh, some blue velvet and a candlestick. And yeah, a book. it's, it's there, there's and a, a few book. loose photographs. It, the, it's the book itself that is bound in blue velvet. Okay. Yeah, and it's got like this like weird like lock thing on it. It was very weird. Yeah, we see like a bunch of loose photographs that she kind of just does a quick flip through, and we can tell that she's searching for something specific. And then on a lower shelf, she finds a framed photo. Of two young women. And she takes it into the living room. And she says that it is a picture of Gail and Grams. And Gail says that it was taken outside their sorority house. So, of course, I had to look up sorority. Even though I know what it is. You know, we do have a few Mm -hmm. listeners that do not live in in the U.S. So, yeah. 
So North American fraternity and sorority housing refers largely to the houses or housing areas in which fraternity and sorority members live and work together. Fraternity members and sorority members do not live together. They live in their own separate things. Mm -hmm. They are two separate entities because fraternities are usually boys, whereas sororities are usually women. Uh, yeah, if you're going and in you the notice traditional... I did not, you notice I did not say fraternities are men. They are boys, whereas yeah. sororities are women. Because occasionally girls, uh, yes, but that is few and far between. Usually, sororities yes. are much society being what society better. is. Yeah, at least so, the the residential fraternities and sororities will right. be a uh, single gender quotes only. Yeah, whereas a an honorary whatever generally Doesn't sororities matter. will be just women. Fraternities can be coed. Yes, and I know this because I was in a coed fraternity. For music well, in college. Yeah. Which started off as a sorority, but then it went co-ed and turned into a fraternity. Oh, cool. Because I'm for whatever reason, certain... the default is male when you have both. Well, yeah, it, that happens a lot in our mm -hmm. society. I'm fairly certain that my mother is part of a, a history fraternity. Oh, cool. So, Is yeah. that where she started doing the genealogy stuff? No, she's been doing that forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was just her, that is her passion. Mm -hmm. She enjoys finding dead relatives. Oh, I was reading an article this week about a woman who did the, like, um, Ancestry.com genetic profile mm -hmm. and found out that she was 50% Ashkenazi Jewish. Oh, wow. When her father was an Irish Catholic. Wow. Uh-huh. And they found out that her father and another baby were switched at birth. Interesting. Uh-huh. And see, they they went through, like, years of doing this because she found out that her paternal first cousin was not genetically related to her at all. So dad's sister was not dad's sister. But mm. everything with mom checked out. Um, and they, they went looking through, like, old family photos, and they're like, yeah, dad doesn't look like any of his family because he's like five four and very darkly complected mm -hmm. whereas they're like irish catholic and they're like blonde hair blue eyed kind of deal <laughs> and then they eventually like several years later another woman popped up as possibly being related to her first cousin so they asked if they do like a comparison and sure enough those two were first cousins nice and so they contacted the woman and they're like hey was your dad born on this date? And they found him in the registry of all the births that happened at this hospital that were not ordered by time or alphabet for whatever goddamn reason. No. And also, the name of that baby was misspelled on the birth certificate because 1913. And It happens. Yeah. And apparently when that guy, who was like six foot and blue eyed was dating Jewish girls, he had to show his birth certificate to be like, yes, I am Jewish. <laughs> well, Technically, yes and no. Hey, you know. Uh -huh. And both of both of the dudes were dead by this point, so they yeah. even if they could have told them, they might not have wanted to because their dad was very proud of his Irish heritage or what he thought was his Irish heritage, and the other one's very proud of their Jewish heritage or what they thought was his Jewish heritage. Yep. It was just a really interesting thing that could have only been figured out this way because the woman she messaged her and the woman's like yeah i thought it was going to be a lot more jewish than i actually was <laughs> turns out i'm part irish we're like we thought we were gonna be more irish than we actually were because both of their parents were irish catholic yep so there you go i know it's insane it's crazy and so much fun so anyway the whole point of the, the sorority fraternity thing whatever was just the fact that it, it was a thing that happens in colleges mm hmm I it's a, don't know. It's if... a lot more prevalent in certain colleges across the U.S. and less prevalent in other ones. Mm -hmm. Like I know Butler, my alma mater, was like thirty percent Greek, as they call them, because they're all like titled with Greek letters. Yeah, usually two or three. I I've never seen one with four, but I think we're running out of names, so it might happen at some point. Yeah, who knows? Um, and they'll all usually have like cutesy abbreviations like the three deltas is tri-delt yeah i my every time i see tri-delt i immediately think of the snl skit mm -hmm. it was delta 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 can i help you help you help you <laughs> every I time remember that one. Oh, it was oh and great. then i forget what the full 
lettering of this one was, but there was a fraternity on campus that was just called Teak. So try something chi- Epsilon. I, no, 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 no. It wasn't, that wasn't like, it was just an abbreviation. Oh. I think it was, I, I don't even remember it. I have to look it up. But they were constantly under trouble. Wow. And we definitely had a fraternity shut down because there was some uh, assault shit going on. Yeah, there is usually more, like, bad crap that happens with fraternities Mm -hmm. because when you put that many alpha males in a room, shit goes down and... And when you add more boys... Alcohol and... Well, no, no, no. When you add more boys into that, the structure is already so hyper-masculine that they yep. have to follow that or eventually get kicked out. And the thing is that sororities, they don't allow even women past the front door unless they are vouched for. Yeah. And they will not allow men anywhere near the fucking stairs. Yeah. Because they're very, very anal about that. And it makes it made me feel safe when I was visiting one. That's good. I never wanted to be part of them because the hours you have to do at those things is insane. And yeah. I was like, music major? Hell no. Yeah, here's my thing when it comes to to sororities and fraternities. Is to get into said sorority or fraternity, there is a process of hazing that happens. There's a, uh, before that even, there's a process of bidding well, yeah, but that that isn't nearly as obnoxious. Uh-huh. But this process of hazing is basically, if you look at, like, if you watch movies about fraternities where it's literally like, yeah. here, run run across campus in your underwear and go find, you know, a blade of grass that's three inches long and then come back and spout out some bullshit phrase and that, like, that shit is actually what happens. Mm-hmm. Like... And worse sometimes. Yeah, and worse. And so, like, per, for me personally, while I did not go to a school... A college that had fraternity or sorority because I did not go to college really. Well, I, it was a community. Yeah, I, I had I had a semester of community college. Well, they but, don't really have any residents, so they can't have resident fraternities and sororities. Exactly. So, like, I didn't have to deal with the whole Greek system. But mm-hmm. the the fact alone that if I had gone to a school, I never would have gone through the Greek system because I'm sorry. You're going to make fun of me and degrade me and then expect me to enjoy your company? Mm-hmm. And it's, be friends forever? No, I don't a, think so. It's a bit of a popularity thing combined with social expectation, combined with mock service, and every single fraternity and sorority house will have its own personality that is known about on campus, mm-hmm. which is why we were explicitly told never go past the front door antique. Mm-hmm. Because though they never fully got in trouble they were always just close enough to the line where you're like avoid them there were certain there were certain fraternities where they're like yeah the dudes from here are great they're awesome (laughs) one of them has a seesaw out front on a giant rock nice and they were right next to the music building so i'd like walk past them all the time and i was friends with a lot of dudes in there and their house mom was great but they were definitely the best out of all the fraternities and even then you're like i don't necessarily want to go in there yeah all the time yeah, I just, I've never really understood, it's kind of like that gang mentality mm-hmm. of like... Yeah, whereas the different sororities was like, oh, Thank you, they're more into this type of girl, or this type of girl. Like, all of the overachievers mm-hmm. literally were in one sorority. Yep, yep. And this other sorority was known for having a bunch of music majors. Yeah. And one of them, oh, <laughs> this was a... a interesting correlation i noticed at college if a girl said that she was a speech and communication disorders major Mm -hmm. 90 percent of the time she was also in a sorority and so whenever someone i'd ask oh what's your major and they're like oh speech and communications disorders i'm like great what sorority you in and they'd always answer with a sorority and they'd be like they never (laughs) ask why i asked that question Uh uh-huh yep yep. i think two times someone was like i'm not in one what why do you ask i'm like "Eh, correlation (laughs) i'm taking a poll it's a thing, you know. It's just one of those weird patterns I've noticed. Because those those people tend to be more social, which I think is mm-hmm. why the major attracts so many people that are also attracted to sororities. Yeah. And I, I very briefly considered going to one sorority, and then I'm like, mm, nah, let's not. 
Yeah. I mean, you're only allowed to uh, bid your freshman and sophomore year, which is weird. Well, but it's, it's very much a, a gang mentality of we will, you know, fight you into this thing and then you're one of us for life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and generally the, the hazing, the relative hazing with sororities is lesser than with fraternities, depending on what college you're at. Yeah. Because a lot of the smaller colleges are able to have a lot more control over the Greek houses. Yeah, and it's also... Especially when you have a larger percentage of the campus that is in them, then you have to make sure because it will be a larger problem. Yeah. Relatively. Yeah, and it's also the, the difference between boys versus girls uh -huh. in, in that boys are very much a let's beat the crap out of you... Mm -hmm. And humiliate you, and then you'll love us forever. Whereas girls are much more like, here, do your entire face up like a clown and go walk walk that way. As opposed, and your initiation, to... you have to wear a white dress. Yeah, which is a weird sort of purity ritual that I don't like. Well, there is that, but like, mm -hmm. I I think I I would be a little bit better with the you know face full of clown makeup and go you know walk into the pool. Wearing full, wearing a full clothing outfit, whatever. Around us, it was more like really funny scavenger hunts. Yeah, see, which that, I'm used to. Yeah, like that, I'd be okay with. But like, I just, I can't get around the thought of you're going to humiliate me and make fun mm -hmm. of me, and then expect me to like you and yeah. and want to be around you. Also, all of the sororities were dry. Well, which helped. You know that the fraternities, that does help. some of them were forced to be dry because that was like strike one. Yeah. Strike one, they made you be dry. That, and you, for, no for, one, for anyone who no doesn't one was understand allowed, what that means. No that one's means, allowed to have alcohol. Yeah, that means no alcohol. Ever. Even if you're 21, it's not to enter the premises. Yeah. You're supposed to keep it elsewhere or just not have it. Drink off campus. Keep it at your fraternity friend's house. Whatever. Just yeah, don't find, have find it. Find a different spot to have it. Yeah. Live outside of the sorority or fraternity or whatever. Yeah. I, I think that Strike that two is they're not allowed to take any new members, I think was the procedure. I don't know. Which would slowly starve them anyway. And so they'd be forced to, you know, reform. Yeah. Um, and then strike three is just, you're gone. Yeah. All right. So we've been now talking about sororities and fraternities for like 10 minutes. Oh my minutes. God. There's just so maybe much to talk about. Yeah. We, maybe we'll do like a, a side thing and just chat for a while. But I mean, it's let's get half back of to our the name. Show. I know, right? Mm-hmm. That, that is. Yeah. It is termed chats, but you know, uh, like. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, we anyway. never find out what sorority galen grams were in yeah no which it doesn't particularly it doesn't really matter. matter yeah it was just more of a mm -hmm. oh this was that and was the quickest way to say that that we both girls were in college is what yes, that was exactly so there's and a, a, um they have a if, little <laughs> you you may immediately recognize the person who is supposed to be gail in the photo but we'll talk about her later right we will talk about her later Anyway, so they have a little bit of idle chatter, and then Gail asks if they have any special men in their lives. Because that's what all the old ladies in your life ask when they haven't seen you since you were teenagers. Indeed. Or at least in a few years, which we are implied that Gail hasn't. Gail definitely hasn't seen them since Phoebe moved back. Yes. Because otherwise we would have seen her. Well, not necessarily, because well, we they were fighting about her. Like, they were fighting demons that we didn't know about, you know, green goop and... Mm -hmm. tan, tan hiking boots, I mean. Yeah, we're starting to get into the bit of the show where they'll actively talk about stuff that happened off screen a lot. Yeah. Which I'm, I like. I enjoy mm -hmm. the fact that it isn't like we only see them. It's not like them. their life is on pause for a week and then suddenly starts back up. For yeah, a exactly. Days. So Phoebe, of course, says an emphatic no. And Prue says that Piper has someone... Sort of. She kind of has two someones. Yeah. Phoebe just thinks that they're picky because they don't want to have as many husbands as Grams did. But Gail warns them about becoming old spinsters like her. Yeah. So a spinster is a semi-obsolete term used to refer to an unmarried woman who was older than what was in earlier times perceived as the prime age range during which a woman should be married. Generally determined by what age... They stop having healthy babies? Yeah. I guess? Yeah, kind of. like, you know, the human reproductive system is a goddamn mess, thanks evolution. Well. And so the longer the eggs sit around in stasis, which is what they are, for, for those who don't know, all the eggs a uterus-owning person will have in their life are created in utero. Mm hmm They mature to a certain point, and then approximately once a month, depending on what your cycle might be, one is chosen to mature 
pop out and be ready for baby. Yep. And unfortunately, being in stasis, it's kind of like sticking something in the freezer for a long time. You'll get freezer burn sometimes, and then shit'll happen. Yep. Which is an unfortunately apt metaphor for mm-hmm. how this works. So, yeah. the longer they're in stasis, the more chances are that something that could go wrong, Will birth go defects, wrong. Yeah. yeah, like the the chances that, you know, maybe the baby will have Down syndrome or any number of birth abnormalities, Yeah, or uh, just will not happen. Yeah. Well, I did learn that the most interesting thing is that you're, you're best until you're in your 30s. Mm-hmm. And, like, there's something about being in your 30s that your body is like, here, let's give you all of the bad things. But then when you get, you, when you get back to your 40s, then those bad things start to go back down again. Most of them, yeah. I think. But then it's also going to be harder on your body. Well, of course. But it's just interesting that, like, all and of the most, things that, that were yeah. the possibility in your 30s to be fucked up kind of don't happen if you're in your 40s. Mm-hmm. It's very, very weird. And it also depends on... If it's your first baby or yeah. not or whatever. Like, but, my mom had kids fairly late. She was 38 when she had my brother. She turned 41 right after she had me. Yeah. And with both of those, like, she, her weird complication was that she just started going to labor really early at, like, five months. Wow. And so she was put on graduated bed rest. Yeah. And, you know, by the time she was at term... Like, she was fully dilated. She'd just been fully dilated. And ten minutes is all it took. Well, there you go. Because I was also, like, a month early, so I was tiny. Yeah. It is fascinating. Yeah. Like, just fascinating how Mm -hmm. shit works with our bodies. It is just... Yeah, the pleasure center is right next to the waste disposal unit. Exactly. Which is just fucked up. Yeah. Well, you know, there is that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so Spencer could also indicate a woman that is considered unlikely to ever marry... So it was basically used for, you know, lesbians. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, they the, she's showing no interest in men. She's going to be a spinster. It's yeah. basically how that happened. The term originally denoted a woman whose occupation was to spin, meaning spinning yarn. Mm-hmm. Several dictionaries flag it as a derogatory term. Which, it, it's so out of the vernacular now that that's pretty much faded. Right. It's uh-huh. more a quaint term. Yeah. A synonymous but more pejorative term is old maid. And there's a card game named that. Yeah. There are no equivalent terms for males. Uh, Not really. Really, not exactly. There's the established bachelor. Yeah. Or confirmed bachelor. Confirmed bachelor. Which is also kind of a synonym for just gay dude. Yeah. The, okay, so let Kind me, of. It's like, it's a euphemism, rather. Yeah, it's a euphemism for, for, for gay dude. So let me let me do a thing for you. This is the funniest thing ever, right? Mm-hmm. So one of my friends is convinced that Leonardo DiCaprio is gay. Okay. Because he only ever dates really hot models, and he's only with them for a short period of time before he goes on to the next one. And I'm just like, no, that's just called, he has access to really hot models, and he gets bored easily. I mean... But this I can is, see it but going this same anyway. friend, But the same friend also thought that George Clooney was gay because he, like, was a serial dater and never got married. And then he got married and now has twins. So, you know, like... He's married let... to an extremely accomplished woman. Amal Clooney is awesome. Yes. She Look is her up. Really cool. Yeah. Really cool. Human rights lawyer. Like... Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. He married well. He did. He married up. Which yeah. is saying something. Yeah. Anyway... So it's just, you can't judge a, a person just by looking at them. And just by looking at who they date. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, if you if you looked at my dating history, you'd be like, oh, she's probably straight. But, you yeah. know. Yeah. No. If you look at my dating history, you'd probably realize I'm asexual. Because <laughs> I have none. Well, you know, there is that. I have lips. Nothing else. Hey, you know, there's nothing I've wrong I've been with on that. dates. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. I have mostly dated men. I have a couple of ex-girlfriends, but they were all literally crazy. Most of the guys I dated were crazy as well, but that's a story for another day. And another like podcast. stories. Yeah, like, and another podcast. But yeah, it's it's just, like, you can't, you can't, it, you know, the, the old adage of you can't judge books by its cover, it kind of works for that too. It's like, you can't judge a person by who they're dating, you know? Anyway, so... They ask why Gail is in town, and she mentions a bridge club 
that Graham's hosted at the house. Specifically, she says, hey, you remember that bridge club? It wasn't the bridge club. Yeah, did you ever actually see us playing bridge? It's like, no, well, Graham's always made us go outside to play. Yeah, that's because it wasn't a bridge club. It was actually her coven. You know. FYI. Yeah. So, really quickly, for anyone who doesn't know what bridge is, it's actually apparently called contract bridge. Something like that. Yeah, which is shortened to bridge. It is a trick-taking game that uses a standard 52-card deck. It's played with four players in two competing partnerships with partners sitting opposite each other around a table. That's about as far as I read onto the wiki and went, this is kind of boring, but I'll link to it anyway, because, mm-hmm. you know, who knows? You might learn it's a new card like game. It's that kind of game set that you think of old ladies playing, like Pinochle. Yeah, and Canasta. Yeah. Canasta feels like a really East Coast thing. I think it's the name. Yeah, probably. Canasta. Canasta. Anyway. Anyway, so... Prue, Prue tries to play this down. Wow, a... you and Grams? Witches? Who knew? And Gail's like, sweetie, you don't have to pretend. Grams told me fucking everything. And even, like, mentions that she was told that they were the charmed ones. Yeah, that when Grams died, you'd become charmed. Like, that's a thing that just, sure, I'll tell everybody about, you know. I won't tell the girls themselves, but I'll tell this random person in my life, in my coven, sure. Well, I mean, if she was in the coven, then she's probably heard all the stories. Graham's probably told her about the family history. And then once Phoebe came along, she had to mention, like, she probably told her the lore about the Charmed Ones being the three sisters or whatever. And so then Phoebe comes along and she's like, oh shit, yeah. Yeah, probably. Anyway, so then, because we can't stay in one place too long... We jump over to P3. No exterior exterior shot. shot. We see Piper behind the bar pacing as Dan walks down the stairs. Yeah. He is in a white t-shirt under a tan button-down, tucked into his jeans because... No, it wasn't. But, like, I really think I just really get annoyed with Dan because he tucks his shirts into his pants and wears a belt. Like, it's just so, like, he's trying to be prim proper and, like whatever and it's just it doesn't work with his hair yeah like it just doesn't look right also it doesn't look good with his hair when he's trying to do that and he doesn't fucking wash it well there is that oh my god it's so greasy in this episode yeah a little bit noticeably yeah so he leans over the bar kisses piper on the cheek and then he puts a small box on the bar it was a little red box with a bow on it and piper does that oh no yeah, kind he of says, thing as he says, like, oh, yeah, I was walking by a store on Fifth Avenue. I couldn't resist. Yeah. So she, of course, freezes him because she's worried about what's going to be in this box. And so she opens the box and pulls out a little red velvet box. And she's like, please don't be a ring. Please don't be a ring. Yeah. It's very, it was very uh, Robin Trubatsky of her. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Other than the, it's not in a champagne glass well, delivered to the wrong table. Yeah. So she opens the box, and it's a pair of pearl earrings. Pearl which, studs. Yeah. Really not her style. No, not even remotely. Yeah. No. Like, they're fine enough, but, I mean, speaking of old maid stuff. Well, there is that. So, seeing that it's earrings, not a ring, she does calm a little bit. So she closes the box, puts it back in the little thingy, and then unfreezes Dan. She reopens it so he can see her doing it, tells yep. him... They're beautiful and thanks him. But she isn't like her usual perky self and he kind of picks up on that. she's looking down a lot, not really looking at him. And he's like, oh, did you think it was a ring? And she does probably the worst um, response to that kind of a question from- Of course not. Don't be silly. Which is, and Dan's like, well, clearly I didn't want to hear that. Yeah. And then the bar phone rings, but she doesn't go to get it, saying that the machine will pick it up and tells Dan that they need to talk, Mm -hmm. which, of course, is never a phrase that anyone ever wants to hear, but, you know. No, it's the four words equaling the death knell. Yeah. So we hear Prue's voice on the machine as Dan asks what Piper wants to talk about, and we hear Prue say that Aunt Gail's in town, and she knows we're you-know-whats. And so Piper dashes over to the phone, picks it up, and tells Prue, hey, Dan's fucking here. And she's yeah, like, yeah, not alone, know. you know. And Prue's like, I know. I figured that'd get your attention. Yeah. So apparently she has to tell her this important thing. Piper, of course, tries to get off the phone. But Prue is like, you know, Angel is in demon trouble and needs our help. So Piper passive aggressively says that she'll put her life on hold one more time to come help. And she hangs up the phone. Mm-hmm. Dan asks her about it and wonders if 
she maybe wants to talk about it on the way to the car. And I'm thinking, Dan, do you also need to go to the optometrist? Because there's all these signs and you're just not fucking reading them. Yep, yep. So Piper has one of my maybe favorite Maybe that's little... why he doesn't know his hair is greasy. Maybe he, he just can't, can't see, see it. it. Yeah. But Piper has one of my favorite little moments where she goes, no, yeah, I really wouldn't yeah. like to talk about this at yeah. all. So she... she she's like, maybe we'll talk about it at dinner tonight. You know what? Scratch that. Tomorrow night, I don't want to have to cancel on you. And he can at least tell she's not being bitter at him. Yeah. Or about him. She's yeah. being bitter about the phone call. Yeah, the fact that she has once again got to change what, what her plans were yes. going to be. And he says, it's a date. There's an awkward beat where neither of them does anything, and then he kisses her on the cheek. Yeah. And so we can see that as she leaves, she has paired that top with a long black skirt. So you were right. But I was right in that it was going to be black. So there you go. Anyway, I mean, doesn't the, matter. Like the colored ones, she might pair with a color, but not if they're the shiny. Yeah. Whoever does Piper's wardrobe. Does a good job, generally, except when they pick extremely dated pieces like this. Well, you know. Yeah. We, we had mm-hmm. so many thoughts. Yeah. So many thoughts. Anyway. Dan so- realizes she's left the earrings just sitting out on the bar and starts to call after her, but then thinks better of it. Yeah. I, I do have a thought process in this, is that we notice in this, he never kisses her on the mouth, or at least he hasn't in a long time. It's he kisses her on the forehead, he kisses her on the cheek, like... It's been a while since he we've... knows something is up. Yeah, but at this point in the episode, we don't see any evidence that he's cluing in exactly. Yeah, it's just very interesting because, like, it's happened for the past few episodes that he's been in. If they interact, he kisses her on the forehead or he kisses her on the cheek. He hasn't kissed her on the lips since like the first episode that they started dating. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's very interesting. Well, no, not not. No, no, there's been a few times. The Cupid episode. Uh, well, yeah, okay. So the second episode. Was it the second episode? I don't know. I don't remember. I have a horrible memory. We have established this. But it's just, it's been a while since we've seen them actually kiss, like, on the mouth. Mm-hmm. And it's just an interesting little side bit. That's all. Yeah, a little bit. Anyway, so we go back to the manor with an exterior shot and the green foliage is back on the trellis. So, yeah, who knows? Prue, Piper, Phoebe, and Gail are all in the wicker room, and the girls are wondering if Gail contacted the police, but she says that she can't exactly tell them that there's a demon running loose. And how does she know there's a demon running loose? Well, apparently there have been a few corpses that have been found dug up and skinned. Mm -hmm. Gail mentions the Book of Shadows, and Prue kind of, like, stops her, and she's like, wait, wait a fucking second, how do you know about that? Like... Uh, assume Grams told her I know, right? She says that Grams told her about it, of course, and that she remembers seeing something about a skinned demon who made people young again. And she's doing a fairly halfway decent job of making it just sound like she's kind of remembering something Mm -hmm. and not doing that, like, leading question thing. Yeah. My favorite, though, is that Piper questions why making people young again is a bad thing. And Phoebe is the one that's like, well, you know, there's always a catch. And Gail's like, maybe we should just go check the book. Uh Uh-huh. To which my brain went, red flags, girls. Why is there no red flags? Like, I understand that, you know, you've known this woman for a very long time. No, no, no. They they think it's just, they see red flags and they're like, I'd make a great shirt out of that. Yeah, apparently. Handkerchief style. and Yeah, yeah. Prue and Phoebe are just like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Since Piper is the only one who wouldn't wear a handkerchief-style top as of yet, yeah. she's the only one seeing the flags for flags. Indeed. And not for potential outfits. Yes. So, we cut back to an exterior day shot of the very large, beautiful Victorian from earlier. It is a slightly different angle this time. Inside, we see Helen and Amanda sewing what looks like pieces of leather, but, you know, are apparently pieces of skin, into what Amanda calls a skin quilt, which mm-hmm. just... Picture that in your brain. Yeah, it's it's very Buffalo Bell. It, yeah. Except they're not using a pattern. Yeah, it is very haphazard, like, different shades of stuff. It's It was weird. But they're, they're putting the skin pieces on a mannequin, so it's more like a skin suit than a skin quilt. Mm-hmm. But whatever. So then we cut back to the manor, this time with no exterior mm-hmm. shot. And we see all of the the lovely ladies are in the attic. They're looking at the Book of Shadows. Phoebe finds the page on Crito, the demon of vanity. And Gail does a slightly less better rendition of 
Oh, that sounds familiar. Yep. Phoebe then squints while trying to read the Book and of Shadows. And she kind of leans forward as yep. she is squinting. She explains that Crito preys on people's vanity, exchanging youth and beauty for souls. Prue kind of wonders why anyone would make that deal, and Gail's like, well, I know of plenty of people, and then tries to play that down by going, you know, because I know old people, and there are lots of victims on there. Yeah, like, you know, I'm, I'm worried about all of my friends who may fall victim to this demon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was it was very yeah. odd. Phoebe Piper finally notices that Phoebe is squinting while reading and yeah. asks her about it, and Phoebe's like, uh, no, no. <laughs> Like, yeah, it was very funny. It was like, Piper goes, are you squinting? And Phoebe's like, no. And then she And then she goes back to squinting. It was very funny. Yeah, apparently, Crito was found out in the 16th century and skinned alive by a group of witches who believed it would keep his spirit from ever being resurrected again. Yeah. But apparently there's still a vanquishing spell because can't be too careful. Yep, someone knew he'd probably be back. And Phoebe's like, oh, this is an easy one. Yeah. Gail tries to flatter them into complacency. By saying that they must be very powerful witches. Yeah, which of course Piper takes as an insult for some reason. She's feeling a little sensitive because remember she the theme says, we established Yeah, the she literally says, yeah, rub it in. Which I thought was hilarious. Like, really? Okay, sure. Gail then asks when they can make it out to Santa Costa, which is apparently where she lives, though that is apparently not a real place because, of course, I tried to look it up. There's there Santa is... everything. How there is not a no. Santa Costa is beyond me. There is a Santa Clara, which is about an hour south of San Francisco, just outside San Jose, mm -hmm. but there is no Santa Costa that I could find on a map. Yeah, I've driven past Santa Clara. Yeah. So, But there should be a Santa Costa. Piper, who is, you know being odd in this episode, asks, asks to talk to her sisters outside. And, and we they see them leave. walk off in a, in a weird direction and then hear the door close? Yeah, it was a little odd. Like, yeah. they, they walked off to the right of the screen as opposed to the left of the screen, which is uh -huh. where we have known that the door has been this entire time. But then, what have we let it go. <laughs> and then Gail does this great, like, sidle over in front of the book and starts flipping through it. Yes, because they have left her alone with the Book of Shadows. Just let that sink in for a moment. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Anyway, we got back to outside of the attic, just Where they down have, the stairs. Yeah, they've gone down the stairs. Piper seems to think that Gail's story is a bit fishy, because Gail is the only one noticing bodies being dug up all over town, and she's lamenting the fact that she doesn't even have time to break up with Dan properly, because all this shit keeps happening. Mm -hmm. Quick cut then, back to the attic. Gail finds a spell in the book to separate a witch from her powers and call a witch's powers. Which are there's both like on the a, same page. Yeah, there's like a potion instruction section that rhymes which is fun mm -hmm. and then a spell at the bottom yeah and so she just kind of rips it out folds it up a la convenience there is nothing on the other side uh -huh. and puts it in her purse yeah i have so many thoughts about this and there's nothing even on the immediate next page that i could see yeah it was just like a blank section yep whatever yep anyway back to so the girls Prue says that Santa Costa is right over the bridge, which I'm sure is a sentence that makes sense to somebody in California. Apparently. I assume they mean Golden Gate. I don't know. They could also be Oakland Bay. I mean, you know, there, there are many a bridge. True. So who knows? It's almost like it's Madison County. Sure. But reminding you that there is no Santa Costa and Santa Clara is, you know, an hour away. Yeah. So I don't know where Santa Costa is supposed to be, but whatever. Gail comes down the stairs, and Prue is like, we'll be there 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Phoebe asks, of course, you know, do you want to crash at the manor? But, but Gail's, Gail's like, like, no, I got nope. cats to feed. Yeah, Bye. go home, feed my cats. Like, oh, oh, all right. And then she walks out of frame, and we get another shot of that gorgeous Victorian. Uh, Gail, Amanda, and Helen are back in their circle. Only this time, the mannequin skin quilt yeah. is in the center. Yep. And so they... They call it the chant for Crito again. The CGI smoke surrounds said mannequin and turns into a very naked dude. With yeah. Extreme puff levels. Yeah. He is very happy to be there. And they ask him. Uh, nope. Amanda yeah, asks him to make them young. And I'm just like, bitch, slow down. Yeah, but he. Like, don't, don't ask. Don't, <laughs> no, 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 no. She doesn't even ask. She's, she's like, like, make, make us young. Make now. us young. She, she's telling this demon. I'm like, honey. Honey, <laughs> slow your roll. Slow down. Slow your fucking Swiss roll here. <laughs> calm the hell down. Calm your tits. You're They're going to piss him off. You, like, calm your tits. They're not as perky as they used to be. Yeah. Um, so he, of course, wants his powers first. Gail says that they will be here soon. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
And so, since we now know that this is Crito, let me tell you about him. He is played by Cameron Bancroft. He is a Canadian actor. He was born in 1967. He started acting in 1986 and got his big break in Canada in 1987 on a show called The Beachcombers. He had a 62 episode run on that show. I will link to it on the website. I know nothing about it because it's a Canadian show and I have never seen it or nor heard of it. But, you know, whatever. He was also on 23 episodes of Beverly Hills 90210. So Which we know... does not surprise me considering his uh, bone structure. Well, there is that. But so we know that he already knew Shannon mm-hmm. because... Everyone was on that fucking show. And he was in 17 episodes of the short-lived superhero show, The Cape, back in 1996. I remember who... I I think I saw it on social media at one point. Someone was mentioning... Oh, no, 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 sorry. I was listening to my brother, my brother and me. And Justin was like, I know what I want to wear to Comic-Con. I want to dress up as the cape. But not the cape, the superhero. I want to dress up as his cape. Alrighty then. Which is, is funny to me. Yes. But yeah. Nice. Anyway. That's my only reference for this. There you go. So to bring it full circle, he played Charles Ingalls in the 2005 miniseries version of Little House on the Prairie. Woo! So there you go. We bring it Uh back a little bit. So we got a commercial break. Well, hang on. Wait. Oh. I just want to mention, he does have a bit of that upturned nose thing, but not quite as hoovilly as the the smoke thing. Yeah. Which I found interesting, because I'm like... They clearly made that CGI smoke monster based off of him. How did they get the nose to be quite that ridiculous? Because he, I'm telling you, he was like, he had I'm his... I'm telling you. I'm telling you. He was like wearing like a, a thing or he was like pushing his face into fabric. That's the only way that works. Possibly, yeah. Like, it is literally the only way that works. But whatever. doesn't matter. We go to commercial break. When we come back, we see cars... Poorly parked Very in poorly diagonal parked. parking spaces on what looks like a small town USA street, but it's probably some suburb of San Francisco. Mm. Small town USA, trademark. Yes. We then see what I think is a very weird sight, but may be completely normal to California people. Like, well, okay, there's... hang on. It probably is some suburb of LA. Well, yes, probably. Yeah. yeah. And it's like those old fashioned gas pumps. Yeah, so there's, like, this little food mart with little, like, cafe tables out front, and there's, like, a trash can and a gas pump right nearby, and there's a red convertible parked right next to the cafe tables, and there are two old men leaning on the car, and they're chatting, and as somebody, for me personally, who can barely handle standing outside the car to pump gas, like, because, you know, the the smell of gas makes me a bit nauseous, I I cannot imagine eating next to a gas station, like... I kind of love the smell of gas being pumped. I can't. And apparently can't this it. is a common thing where because it's hydrocarbons, there there's like a certain subset of people who just find that comforting for whatever reason. Yeah, I can't do it. Like I also find the smell of horse manure fairly comforting as long as it's decently far off. Yeah. No. And skunks actually. It's weird. Yeah. No, not so much for me. Not so much. Like a far off skunk. But, smell. Well, but here's the thing also. Do you like cilantro or does it taste like soap? Neither. Hmm. I hate it, but it doesn't taste like soap. Well, already then. I just hate it. See, for me, it tastes like soap. It tastes like, not rancid, it tastes like annoying parsley. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that it uses you. <sighs> the things that you get cracked up over that I say baffles me and I love it. I now want a shirt that says cilantro, annoying parsley. That is the best thing. Oh, oh, blue. It would have to say cilantro is just annoying parsley. Yes. Oh, my God. That that is the best thing I have heard. I mean, they're related, so. That was beautiful. Oh, God. I'm going to laugh at that again when I go to edit this. I know it. I'm I'm so glad. You're welcome. Oh. That is beautiful. Hold on. Actually, here. Have a dog. Have Come a here, dog. dog. I'm going to put out a tweet. Oh, please. Yes. Quote, cilantro is just, is just annoying just parsley. Annoying parsley. The wisdom of the Kendra CC at Ginger Blivet. There we go. All right. So, Prue, Piper, and Phoebe drive in in mm-hmm. Piper's car, mm-hmm. and they pull up to a gas pump. 
and they get out of the car. Phoebe's holding like this map. Mm -hmm. Phoebe is wearing black pants with little flowers at the ankles, a white crop top with a face on it, and a jean jacket with a leopard print collar. And cuffs. Yeah. Her hair is pulled up in an elaborate updo with like little twisty bits and stuff. Yeah. Like, this is where, like, I look at Phoebe's hair every time and I go, why? It looks like twisty bits and then she upside down French braided the back into a bun. Yeah. Like, I look at this oh. hairdo and I go, there is no way she did this by herself. And if she did do this by herself, it would have taken hours. Yeah. Which is probably why they were so late, as they mentioned in a second. Yeah. Prue is wearing black pants and a white top under a tan button-down overshirt. Her hair is mostly down, but there's a few braids that pull back into the middle. Mm -hmm. Piper is in a light blue top under a darker blue jacket and greenish-brown pants. That's an interesting combo. Are, are, are the pants made from female sheep? I don't think so. Okay. Her hair is just down. There's no, like, embellishment on hers. Piper is criticizing Phoebe because apparently they're a few hours late. Minding you, they were saying that they were going to be there at 9 a.m. Phoebe is like, not my fault. There's no connector road to Route 28. Prue walks up beside her, looks at the map, and she goes, hang on a sec. You mean What's this? this? Yeah. And Phoebe's like, oh, you mean that squiggly bit? Anyone could have missed that. Yeah. Phoebe, once again, shoots down the thought of needing glasses, and Prue says that she wears glasses and there's nothing wrong with wearing them. But Phoebe, like, kind of half flatly, jokes. It was a very flat delivery, and you're not quite sure whether or not she's joking. She's like, yeah, but you're older. And then Piper, like, chuckles. Yeah. She basically was saying that, you know, you're old, so you need glasses. Which, yeah. like, bitch, I've been wearing glasses since I was eight. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, whatever. Prue, Prue, of course, jokes about the demon of vanity being after Phoebe, which because was she'd great. Be toast. Yeah. And I chuckled because I was eating toast while I was watching this. There you go. Phoebe, of course, ignores that comment to go ask for directions. Mm -hmm. Piper notices two elderly people walk past them, you know, holding hands and comments on them being cute. And Prue's like, oh, that could be you and Leo in like 50 years. Yeah, but Piper reminds her that white lighters don't age. And she's like, well, he's also not supposed to be dating witches, so I might not have to worry about that. Yeah, and then she's, of course, worried that she's going to end up being like Aunt Gail, mm -hmm. so she is worried about being a spinster. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, we got to Phoebe, who's getting directions from the two elderly guys, one of whom has these delightfully thick glasses. Uh-huh. And they're leaning against their red convertible. Yeah, so they get lines and IMDb credits, so let me tell you about them. Though I do think it's interesting that I believe they were named Cabby Number 1 and Cabby Number mm -hmm. 2. So I'm assuming they were supposed to be cab drivers, even though they're standing against a red convertible, which Weird. is not a taxi, but whatever. Anyway, so one of them is wearing a red Hawaiian shirt. The actor is Bill Wiley. He started acting in 1980. He's mostly done single episodes of shows. And his last IMDb credit was in 2016 in a movie called Punching Henry. So there's that. The other guy is wearing a yellow shirt and a blue jacket with a hat with a B on it. Mm -hmm. I don't... The letter B on it. I'm not sure... <laughs> I'm not sure what that, what that uh, sports team was for. But whatever. This actor is Charles C. Stevenson Jr. And I recognize him immediately. Mm. He started acting in 1990. Wowza. Yeah. He's mostly done single episodes of shows. We will see him again as a different character in season four, but we'll talk about him again then. Yes. Just referencing this, uh -huh. I'm sure. He was on two episodes of Gilmore Girls, which is where I recognize him from. Right. Specifically, one of them was where they had to marry the eldest Lorelai, not the main character, but, like, her grandmother. Hmm. He was the extremely comically old priest who apparently was in Grandma's will that she, he was supposed to do her service. Mm -hmm. And he had a great line where he just turns to Laura and asks her, didn't I just bury you? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So he was, like you said, on two episodes of Gilmore Girls, they were four years apart and he played two different characters, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. His last IMDb credit was also in 2016, and it was the Gilmore Girls reboot miniseries. I don't remember what he played in that. He played a different character. I believe the name was Charlie in the summer and fall. Interesting. Yeah. So there's that. Oh, he must have been during the town meeting. Probably. Yeah. Or something. He was also on Bunheads. Of course he was. Because yeah. once you're, once you're, once you're with, in Gilmore uh, Girls, you gotta be on Bunheads. Once you're with eight pals, you're always. Yeah. So... 
Phoebe is writing down the directions on a small pad of paper, and as she goes to put them into her bag, a black glasses case falls out, apparently. Yeah, we, we hear don't, it click on we, the ground. We kind of hear it click on the ground, but, like, there it's was... It's a very soft clack. Yeah, and there was literally, like, no way reason that it should have fallen out of her purse. A la convenience. But, yeah, a la convenience, what can you do? Yeah. So Hawaiian the, shirt picks them up, and he's like, oh, are these your glasses? But she, and she sees Prue and Phoebe watching from the Jeep, and so she's like, uh, no, no, no totally those aren't, aren't mine. mine. Yeah. <laughs> so he takes them and, and walks away, and Phoebe gets in the car. And I don't understand why he, like, opened up the case to pick them out. I'm like, what? why is that necessary? To establish that they are, in fact, glasses? Like, what? Yeah. Who does that? Yeah, it was a little weird, but, you know, what can you do? So, we then... Quick cut over to Gail's kitchen, where she is stirring something in a pot on the stove. Today she is in shades of orange. And peach. Yeah. Amanda is with her, wearing black and purple, mm-hmm. and we see them looking at the page that she ripped out of the Book of Shadows. So she's making the potion to separate a witch from her powers. Uh-huh. Now, I do want to know where she got the gypsy blood, because that was a thing. Yeah. Just wondering, you know. Uh-huh. Anyway. So, then we get a quick insert shot of Piper's car pulling into the driveway of the house, and we cut back to the kitchen as Helen comes in. She's like, they're here! They're here! Yeah, today she is wearing stripes in shades of blue, and I believe she had paired that with a tan skirt. So, she's letting them know the girls have arrived, and it's really funny because Amanda goes, finally, right? Which, I mean, if they hadn't had finished this potion by the time the, like, Yes. Yeah, I actually what? put that in my notes. I was like, I want to know why they are just now finishing making the potion. If the girls were supposed to be there at nine, they're a couple of hours late. Shouldn't this potion have already been finished and done? I mean, I'm just saying, but like, here's the thing. So Helen wants to know how long they have to wait after the girls drink the potion to call their powers to Crito. Gail, of course, says it shouldn't take very long. And she pours the boiling hot potion into a pitcher which looks like a glass pitcher that already has some liquid in it that looks like it's supposed to be tea yeah, with like, like a shit tea. ton of lemon slices mm-hmm. there's no ice in there at all i there's just, just they'd add it later yeah there's just a shit ton of lemon slices but here's my question if they were actually making this like if the girls were supposed to be there at nine if they had made this potion beforehand then it could have actually been iced tea yeah Just saying. Because then we time jump to a little bit later in the living room, and we know that it's a little later because the girls are sitting on the couch, and we can see that they've each had at least a partial glass of the tea potion stuff. Yeah. But, like, I just, I don't understand. Like, if it's supposed Um, to be hot tea, that's fine, but if it's supposed to be iced tea, there's no way that boiling hot liquid would have been cool enough to be iced tea. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of issues. Yeah. My in-canon reason for why it wasn't finished was maybe it took longer. My... Other, they were looking my, for the gypsy blood. Whatever. My out of canon reason would be, oh, well, they had to show them making it. Yeah. Because otherwise, how do you fucking know how they deliver it? Whatever. But they could have just said it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they could have been like, do you have the potion? Yes. And then pulled up the pitcher of iced tea. Like, did you make the potion? Yes. Or, yeah. or oh, they're finally here. Good. Get the potion of, uh, you know, get the potion out of the fridge. You yeah. know, like, they could Something have just like said it instead of making us watch them put boiling hot liquid into a glass pitcher. Yeah. And then expecting us to believe that they're drinking cold tea. I'm just saying. Just saying. Anyway, so. Amanda is holding the pitcher and she offers more tea for Phoebe and Piper and as Phoebe starts to decline Amanda just fucking pours it into her glass yeah Piper of course tries to say no thank you and Gail is just like just just humor her yeah humor her she won't take no for an answer but Prue just outright covers the glass with her hand yeah she's she's like "Ah, no thank you I'm good so Prue of course asks Gail who else knows about Crito in the room where you know Amanda and Helen are and Gail, of course, says, you know, well, I had to tell Amanda and Helen because Mm -hmm. they were the ones that first told me about the dug-up corpses. And this kind of tickles Piper's uh, Mm -hmm. suspicion. Yeah, but Helen, of course, assures the girls that they won't tell them. We won't tell a soul about you being witches and all. Yeah. Piper pulls a face and she looks in her cup. It's a great face, too. It was an adorable face. But apparently now is when she realizes that the tea tastes weird. So I don't know. Yeah, like, I don't understand why she didn't know that it tasted weird before. Again, they had to show. Yep, a la convenience, what can you do? Uh-huh. So, Gail, Gail says that that it was a, a special blend of tea. 
and then realizes that they're starting to get a little suspicious, maybe, mm-hmm. and tells them that they should get going to look for whoever is trying to summon Kryto. And hey, what, weren't the first few bodies found at that furniture warehouse that's not too far from here? Here, have directions. Now go. Yeah. So they start heading toward the, d- the door, and I think it's very, very funny, though, because Prue takes one last swig of the potion tea before, like, you know, okay, we'll be back, and they go out. Very, but- very polite of her to be like, oh, I must finish my drink that this person has given me. Even though I didn't want any more, I still must finish it. Yeah, it was very funny, because, like, you can see that she's, like, in that rush of, like, I'm going to take this, uh, okay, and then I'll run and put it down. It was, <laughs> it was a very cute very durable, little moment. Very Prue. Yeah, very, very Prue. So they leave. And Helen is, of course, worried because apparently Kryto said they weren't supposed to leave. But Gail says they were getting suspicious. Amanda wonders if Gail is trying to protect them. And, and Gail's, Gail's like, like, oh, fucking course uh, I am. Duh. Yeah. Like, of course like, I am. They're, they're family. family. Like, I feel bad about stealing their powders, but, you know, they're family. I don't want them to get hurt. So they realize that they have to go and just, you know, keep calling for their powers until the potion takes effect. And then we cut time jump over to the girls arriving at said warehouse and I'm just like, based on the directions that Gail gave them, I don't know how they would have found this warehouse, because it's like deep down like a truck alley. Yeah, it was a little weird. And they just said furniture warehouse. They didn't give an address or anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, whatever. They're yeah. just like, oh, go down the street, turn it willow, you'll find it, it's right there. Yeah. I'm just like, how the fuck did you find this? Hey, you know, because Phoebe wasn't the one reading yeah, the map. That's yeah. how. Phoebe's like, well, I wasn't navigating, okay? Yeah. They get out of the car, walk towards the building, and then they go, hey, guys, did this feel like a wild goose chase? And they all kind of agree. Yeah. So a wild goose chase. This is my, I think this is my favorite tangent that I went on. Oh, cool. My, my favorite little wiki rabbit hole. So a wild goose chase is the pursuit of something unattainable or non-existent, such as in a snipe hunt. Now, now, a snipe hunt, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, and it, gentle folk. A snipe hunt is a type of practical joke, basically. It started in North America as early as, like, the 1840s. It's basically where an unsuspecting newcomer is duped into trying to catch some sort of non-existent animal called a snipe. Now, a snipe is actually a real thing. It's a, it's a, it's in the bird family. Hence- um yeah, I'm not going to tell you about the bird. I'll link it on the website. Yes, Kevin, but... Kevin is a lovely bird, and she has adorable, adorable children. Yes, and and Kevin is a snipe. Yeah. Supposedly. Well, she's named a snipe because she's a mysterious, strange bird. And sure, why not? We're in an imaginary place. Let's call her a snipe. Exactly. So, a snipe hunt is a quest for an imaginary creature whose description varies wildly depending on who is saying it. So... Usually the target of said prank is led to an outdoor spot and given instructions for catching the snipe, which often include, you know, waiting until dark, holding an empty bag, making a noise to attract the prey, you know, whatever funny thing that you can think of. Usually it's a very ridiculous noise. Yes. Not like an owl hooting or like a chirping. It's like a oi, oi, or whatever. Yeah, it's usually something really stupid, really silly, and you know that if you do this, people are going to be watching you and laughing, but you still do it anyway because And it, it might include reason. like a strange movement. Yeah, some sort of like funny, like funny la, mating ritual dance typey thing. A la Ministry of Silly Walks type of thing. Yeah. So the others involved in the prank usually leave the newcomer alone in the woods to discover the joke, right? Mm-hmm. So it's an American rite of passage. Uh, it's actually usually done in like summer camps or Boy Scouts, you know, that sort of thing. It's mostly boys doing it because girls aren't that weird. Yeah, girls are like, this is ridiculous. I don't want to do that shit. Yeah. Also, girls are conditioned far younger to realize when they're being made fun of. So true. Mm Mm-hmm. So true. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, Prue starts to say something about Gail just wanting them out of the house, and then she gets kind of lightheaded. And grabs Phoebe's shoulder? No, I think she grabbed a piper. Okay. And then Phoebe, like, grabs her own chest. Oh, yeah. Because she's also not doing so great. And Piper's just kind of like, what's up with you two? Yeah, because Piper isn't feeling it at this point, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. They cut back to Gail's house, where they're chanting the spell, standing in a circle with Kryto, who is now wearing clothing this time. Yeah, all black. Yes, of course. It's black pants, 
black shoes, a black top, and a black belt. Like, where they got these clothes, I don't know. Especially since they were form-fucking-fitted to his body. Let well, me yeah, tell ya. but, you know, he was formed from a mannequin, so I imagine it was pretty easy to find clothing for him. Mm, I don't know. Anyway, the spell that they are chanting is, Powers of the witches rise, course unseen across the skies, come to us who call you near, come to us and settle here. And the camera is kind of just, like, spinning, spinning around, around in a and... circle. Yeah. We have heard this spell before, mm. because, of course, we have. Right. What so, episode was that? Oh, God, I don't remember. Because I'm not remembering it. What was the other story? Wasn't line it the Rex and Hannah one? I'm fairly yeah, certain it was yeah, the Rex and was. Hannah one. Yeah. So, yeah, so the camera spins around them, and then we get, like, an overlay fading of, like, the girls at the warehouse. They're not looking that great. They're, like, sitting on the stairs and, like, leaning against the walls, and they're just not, not doing so good. Well, that one didn't really require the potion, now that I think about it. No. They just had that lamp. Yeah. Whatever. Anyway, Kryto is upset because this spell isn't working, but Gale's like, you know, it will, it and will. Like, it better. And it's at this point where I'm like, ooh, his puff levels got bigger. Yeah. For so, anyone wondering, puff levels are what your hair does when you have really short hair and it tends to, like, puff up. Yes. It's a nerd fighter thing. Yeah. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah. Y'all can Google it yourselves. Yeah. So they continue saying the spell, and then in this overlay of the girls at the warehouse, we, we see, see these, like, like White orb things, which are indicating their powers, kind of like rise up, float out, of, out of the girls, and then float over to Gail's house, and then float into the basement, and float into Crytek. Yeah, like very obviously float into a basement window. Yeah, it was very very weird. But like, as the the orbs float into Crytek, he like looks at his hands, and then sees a lamp without a lampshade on a, it. A nice, lovely ceramic kind of red lamp. Yeah. And just he just, like, moves sits it on a into, box. He just, like, fucking moves his hand, and it flies into a ladder and crashes. It flew into the wall and just imploded. Yep. And I looked at that and went, huh, the learning curve on that power isn't that uh, steep now, is it? Well, I mean, his arm movement is rather jerky. Yeah. Rather so, beef jerky. Yeah. Because so, that's what he's made of. <laughs> yeah, there is that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Gale, of course, then asks Crito to hold up his end of the deal. And he, he holds up his hand and then moves it in front of Gale's face. And, well, see, when she says hold up your end of the deal, I can immediately tell she's on green screen. Yes. Because, like, the outline of her hair is very crisp in a yeah. way old lady's hair is not. Never is. Yeah. And the angle of the wall behind her is really fucking weird. Yeah, it was a very weird mm-hmm. green screen. And we get a lovely morph of her face into the face of the person from the photo. That we saw a, earlier. Yeah. Who's an actress we both recognize. Yes. So, I shall tell you about, about her. her. Yes. Her name is Julia Lee. She was born in 1975. She started acting in 1997. Her first two roles were on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. As the same character, in fact. Just yeah. with different names. The right. first time, she was a vampire wannabe who named herself Chanterelle and was dismayed to find out that that's a mushroom. Yeah, it was kind of funny. Which actually is still weirdly appropriate. Yeah. Because mushrooms are fungi, so they're like dark death and decay and and shit, and they're damn tasty. Well, chanterelles are damn tasty, at least. Yeah. Like shiitake. Yes. So the first time we see her, she is chanterelle. The next time we see her, she is lily, but it is the same character. She has just taken on a new name. And then later we see her in Angel, and she has changed her name yet Yet again again. to Buffy's middle name, Anne. Anne. Yeah. As a tribute. Indeed. So this episode of Charmed was actually her second IMDb credit. So there you go. She was so technically her, her Buffy was just the one role. It was just different names. Right. So but it was yeah. in two different episodes. I know. Yeah. Two different um, episodes, approximately a season apart. Right. And she was in three episodes of Angel. Mm-hmm. And her last credit on IMDb is from 2016. Uh, it is a movie called Unreal Estate. Interesting. Which I think is hilariously funny. It is a drama mystery thriller thing where it's an agoraphobic man who... So agoraphobic is when you you can't leave the house. It's an agoraphobic man's perfectly isolated world begins to unravel with the arrival of his estranged father along with a growing obsession over his missing next-door neighbor. This sounds like an episode of Monk. 
A little bit. Involving, what's his face? The dude who plays Monk's brother. Yeah, I don't remember. Um, have you seen ads for Landline? No. Oh, why do I want to call him Stanley Tucci? That's so annoying. John Turturro. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I do remember him and Monk. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's just been a while since I've seen Monk. Yes. But what I thought was very, very funny is this Unreal Estate. I don't know how big of a role he has on it, but Matthew Moy is in it. And he was on Two Broke Girls. Oh, yeah. He is the tiny Asian Han Lee. Oh, and he's Lars in Steven Universe. Well, alrighty then. But every time I see anything with Two Broke Girls, I am reminded of the fact that I went to high school with the guy who played Oleg. <laughs> and it's still funny to me. Like, I can't see him and just and not be like, yep, that's the kid I went to school with. He's just a little more muscular now with a bigger, bushier beard. Yep. So there is that. Jonathan Kite. Look him up. He's hilarious. He's amazing. And he does an awesome Vince Vaughn impression. I think I've mentioned it before. Oh, lovely. Anyway, so back to the show. Helen and Gail are very amazed at how young Gail has become. And Amanda does that stupid thing that she did before. Where she's like, yeah, me next. Now me. Yeah. And Kratos kind of does this very condescending smile at her like, oh, yeah, sure. Passes his hand in front of her and she just turns into dust. Leaving a pile of clothes on the floor. Gail, of course, cries out, like, what the fuck? And, and then he does, he does the, same the thing exact to same thing to Helen. And he was apparently making a point about how he can take youth away just as easily as he can grant it. Yeah. And then he's like, bitch, do the math. It takes three witches to summon me and three witches to banish me. So fuck you. I'm not going back. Yeah. And then, of course, he tells Gail to introduce him to other willing souls who want to be young again. Bless lest me. he make her old again. Or worse, kill her. Yeah. It was kind of creepy in that, like, way that all bad guys are creepy. Yeah. You know, he goes, beauty has its price. You know. Mm-hmm. We get one last little shot of the clothing on the ground before we cut to outside as the girls pull up in the car. They get out. They go inside. They call out for Aunt Gail. Naturally, the door is unlocked because old lady living in giant house. Of course you leave your door unlocked. Yeah. You know, this entire series has a lot of unlocked doors. It's a very large lot, too. Like, it's... Girl got some money. Yeah. Like, no wonder she's an old man. She saved up all her money. She had no kids. She had no husband. Like... Yeah. Mitch was living. Indeed. So, Prue comes to the realization that it was Gail and her friends who summoned Kraito, and the girls walk into the kitchen where Prue smells something, and then Apparently finds her way. Apparently, it wasn't remnants of the potion they were making in there. It's coming from the basement. Yeah, so... Which is conveniently right, right there next in to the, the kitchen. kitchen. Because, you know, old houses, the cellar is where you keep all the food. Exactly. Before you had, like, a fridge and shit. Yeah. So, they head down the stairs, they find the clothes on the ground, and the ashes are still smoldering. Phoebe wonders what they are, and Prue's like, oh, well, obviously it's Amanda That's Amanda, and, Helen. and I believe that's Helen. And Phoebe's yeah. like, I hope they didn't get that from the tea. Yeah. Prue notices that Gail's clothes are nowhere to be seen, so she's hoping that that's a good thing. And then a rat runs by them on the ground. Piper, of course, being Piper, freaks out, and when she tries to freeze it, nothing happens. We see her and shake her hands a little bit. It was more. the cutest thing ever where she like does this like, why isn't this working? Kind of like handshaky yeah. thing. She like adds a wrist twist into it. It yeah, was real nice. It was very funny. She then tells Prue to try and move the rat. Prue tries and nothing happens and so she wonders, you know, what happened to their powers. And Phoebe's like, maybe we should ask Aunt Gail. Exactly, Blue. Yes, thank and you. And then we go to commercial break. When we come back from commercial break, we get a lovely exterior shot of Gail's place. Piper is now looking at a photo of Gail as a young woman. Like a pageant photo. Yeah. She's wearing a sash. Yeah, it like was a, a sash little, with words on it. A little odd. Prue is looking at pieces of paper on the desk. <laughs> and, it, no, the funniest thing about this is that it's the same hairdo that current Gail is wearing that she was also wearing in the sorority photo. Mm-hmm. So, clearly, they did these all on the same day. Yep. Which, they're fairly nice photos, and they don't, like, they don't look old, but they don't look new. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah. So, Pearl is looking through pieces of paper on the desk, and Phoebe walks in holding what she says is hemlock root. And I'm just like, how was this in the potion and did not kill them? How much... Can, how much hemlock root can a person ingest and I not don't die? I don't know. Who knows? But then we have an entire or scene... Or does something cancel out the hemlock root? Maybe the gypsy's blood. 
Who knows? We have an entire scene of exposition. We learn that Gail has some form of cancer, which is why she wants to be young and healthy again. But of course, that doesn't excuse her behavior because giving up your soul to save your life just isn't worth it. And, you know, it's something to be said for her Medicare that it's paying for all of this because the narrative is not she can't afford all of the treatment. It's she She dying. Yeah, she doesn't want to die. Yeah. Phoebe, of course, doesn't understand why Gale would take their powers. Prue realizes that Crito must have wanted them. And then Piper realizes that they shouldn't have left her alone in the attic with the Book of Shadows. Nope, nope, nope. Duh. They then debate how to get their powers back, hoping that Crito doesn't know how to use them. And Piper jokes about just going home and forgetting about it. And then they all head off. Because, you know, we have once again Piper saying, fuck this, I don't want to be a witch. Mm-hmm. My life would be easier if I wasn't. Yeah. That sort of thing. We flash back to the gas station and we see two dudes dressed in the outfits of the elderly dudes, except these dudes are like... Super young now. Like late 20s, early 30s? Yeah, but they get no IMDb credit, so I can't tell mm-hmm. you anything about them. But we know that it's the same guys because of the clothing, and then they jump into the red convertible. And so. drive the fuck off. Yeah, like speed off, like stupid fast. Oh my god, yeah. Like you... they're young and dumb and they've got a convertible now. Yeah. So we see that Crito and our young Gale are there and she of course laments the fact that those guys didn't know that they were giving up their souls and Crito's like, well, they'll find out one day mm-hmm. their last, <laughs> yeah. without the laughing, but you know. And then a white balding dude in a lovely three-piece suit walks mm-hmm. past them into the gas station, and Gail kind of looks at him. And Crito's like, you recognize him? Introduce me. And she's just like, no. And he goes, are you already tired of being young? And then she's, you know, like, oh, fine, fuck it. Yeah. And they start to walk into the mm-hmm. gas station. Yeah. Then we cut back to Prue Piper and Phoebe in Piper's car. They pull up to a stop sign. I think it was a stop light. No, it was a stop sign. Okay. I'm positive it was a stop sign, but they were on, like, the left side. Yeah. And the red convertible comes up on the right side of them, so it's in it, the right it lane. It actually blows past the white line, stops, and then backs, backs back up. up. And one of the dudes is like, the one hiya the, toots! Yeah, the one in the Hawaiian shirt says, hiya toots! And the other one just, like, howls into the air. It was hilarious. And apparently that didn't give them an IMDb credit. Nope, not at all. Okay. But they drive off, turning left in front of Piper's car, from the right-hand lane. Yeah. Just saying. And, of course, the girls are like... Aren't those the guys from before with the... Fuck, crito has got to be nearby. And so they take off to try and find Crito. And, and my, my assumption is that they then do like a large... Uh, U-turn. U-turn yeah. sort of deal. Yeah. So then we cut back to the gas station where Crito is talking to his next victim, our man in the three-piece suit. And apparently Gail didn't actually introduce them because Crito finishes up his explanation of what he can do by saying, just like I did for... A Gail Altman. Yeah. So And he, the dude finally looks at Gail and he's like, oh my god, yeah, Frank, it's me. Yeah, so here's the thing, right? So Crito is, of course, saying, you know, you have to keep this a secret and, and That's you know, the only catch. Yeah, the only catch is you have to keep it a secret. So, but apparently this guy's name is Frank and he knows Gail, but on IMDb he's listed as Mr. York, but he's never called that. Nah. So it's very weird to me. It's like the, the the two old guys being called cabbie. Yeah. Like, but they weren't cab drivers, so I don't understand. Maybe it has an extra context that we just don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. So this actor, since he is on IMDb, I shall tell you about him. It's a very short thing. His name is John Goins. He was born in 1943. He started acting in 1972, and he's still going, but he has mostly done almost exclusively single episodes of TV shows. Well, you know, some people get a lot of work doing that. Yeah, he's just been in a lot of them. Yeah. So he is what my mother would call a Valentine Jenicky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's that, you know, that yeah, like he's he's in everything, but you never really know who he is, but you always recognize him when you see him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So once Frank believes Crito. He gets turned young, he starts to walk away, and we, and we see... get a shot of the glasses case that Phoebe dropped earlier yeah. on the counter because that's where one of the uh, cabbies yeah. took it in and just left it there, you know, for like a lost and found type deal. Yeah. And so Crito was like, oh, well, these must be Frank's. He he picks them up and like points them at Frank. Like, you forgot your. And then he has a premonition of, of the girls. Piper and Phoebe vanquishing him. Yeah. 
So he, of course, then gets mad at Gale because she lied to him. And told him that she took care of the witches. Yeah, which... Which is apparently how... <laughs> which is uh, apparently how she got him to believe that she'd kept up her end of the deal about, like, not letting them leave. She's like, oh, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry about them. I took care of them. Yeah, which I don't really understand the logic there. I but... mean, it was his what? it was his condition, but of course, like... She's their surrogate, like, great-aunt type deal. So, yeah. of course, she's not going to do that shit. Yeah. So, so he gets... He gets mad at, and yells at her, whatever. And then, and then we, the girls, a la convenience... Jeep pull up yeah. at the gas station. And they all get out of the car. Yeah. Gail sees them first. She runs outside and yells at them to run. But Kryto, and, like, grabs the back of her sweater and, like, holds her in front of the door. Yeah. And they, like, get out of the car. They're very confused. And Kryto, using Peru's power, makes a crowbar fly towards them. They duck just in time, and it breaks the window in Piper's car. Yeah. Piper's like, so much about him not knowing how to use the powers. Yeah. And Kratos just pushes Gale to the ground. And then Phoebe tries to be a hero, saying that, you know, I have a power he doesn't know about. And as she starts to make her way toward him, Kraito makes her fly through the air. And Prue's just like, uh, come here, and pulls Piper down behind the gas pump to hide. Now, I just have to say this really quickly. Because I go through transcripts to have all of these lovely lines and such the original transcript called the gas pump a petrol bowser which is apparently an australian thing that's funny yeah i like that yeah i just thought it was interesting that a petrol bowser like i knew petrol was a thing for instead of gasoline it's petrol and i get that mm -hmm. but bowser instead i just of think mario like, kart yeah yeah but it was just it was interesting and i thought i would mention it because why not Mm -hmm. anyway, anyway, the girls so, are trying to figure out what to do because they, they yeah, need what, to figure what out do, what they what, know. Yeah, that what he they know about, his, about, their powers. about their powers that he doesn't know yet. And Gail runs behind the car where Phoebe is hiding. Yeah, and Phoebe it's hilarious. Is not like, happy to see her. Yeah, Phoebe's just like, get away from me, which is just great. She's like, yeah. you know, leave me alone. Yeah. But she looks above the car and like sees Prue and Piper. She puts and, her like, hands up. Like, in a mock surrender kind of deal, and nods. Yeah, which apparently makes them all realize that they're kind of on the same page. Well, it makes Prue realize they're all on the same page. And yeah. Piper's like, what page is that? Yeah, it, it was definitely interesting of, like, you know, oh, mm -hmm. okay, well, we, we seem to be on the same page. Yeah. Not sure what that is, but let, it'll, let's work it. It'll be uh -huh. fine. Kratos 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 tells them that they can't hide, and this gives Gail time to give Phoebe the spell that she stole from the Book of Shadows. Yeah, she hands her the page and is like, you know, I'm sorry, I just didn't want to die, but you're going to need this. Here you go. And Prue then tells Piper to follow her lead. And then immediately stands up, drags Piper out from behind the petrol bowser. Yeah. And says, we give up! Yeah, which of course seems to surprise Piper. She's like, wait, we do? <laughs> it was very yeah. funny. Phoebe and then, sneaks up, well, sneaks up behind yeah, quote Kraito, unquote. Yeah. And Prue does that like, that obvious faint where she's like, no, no Phoebe, Phoebe, he'll, he'll freeze us. you. And so then Kryto, like, puts one hand out to each side and does the freezy motion. Yeah. And you can clearly see that this is just Phoebe and Prue and Piper all stopping because, A, you see Phoebe sway a little bit and then yeah. you cut over to... Piper and Prue, and Piper's hair is blowing in the wind, which right. wouldn't happen if she were frozen. Right. But you also see Phoebe blinking. Yes. Which was hilarious to me. So Kraito, like, tries and, to freeze and, and then, then turns, and turns around. Piper and Prue. Yeah. And, and Prue, he's, like, very happy about this new power. Yeah. He's gloating. Yeah. He, like, Phoebe waits until he's completely turned around and gloating about how cool this power is. And then she fucking kicks him in the ribs. Yeah, and she punches him, and she's like, good witches don't freeze. Yeah. Which was great. And then they all run, and yeah. Gail's following kind of behind them, but Kryto has the wherewithal to send her flying through the tinted glass window of the store. Yeah, I feel bad for whoever owns that little food mart, because... Yeah. You Who know, we never fucking see. Yeah, we never see anybody inside it. Mm, yeah. They're, they're slacking on their job. Yeah. So, or they're smart, and they know not to get involved in this kind of shit. That 
that could be as well. Yeah. So then we cut back to the girls who have run away. They are hiding on the side of a building. And I think it's interesting because there's a bulletin board on the side of the building. For SWA properties. Yeah, there's like little signs for SWA properties on it, which is a nice callback to earlier episodes. It looked formatted, kind of like you would see a restaurant menu that was posted outside the door. That's what it kind of looked like to me. A little bit. A little bit. Until I saw the properties bit. I'm like, ooh, what restaurant is this? Yeah. But anyway, Phoebe wonders what they should do about Dale, and Prue's like, well, without our powers, there's not much we can do, so maybe we should prioritize that shit first. Yeah, let's get them back. So Prue and Phoebe start to walk away and, like, leave to go figure out how to get their powers back, but Piper just kind of stands there. And they ask her what's wrong, and she's like, you know, I've had it with being I'm a witch. I'm done. Yeah, and then I'm done. And then she walks. Yeah, like, she walks away from them, but she kind of, like, walks through them. Yeah. And just kind of walks past them. Mm-hmm. We and cut then, back to the gas station. Crito is looking through the broken window at Gail, who was just laid out on the floor on her back and yep. refusing to get up. Yep, he's mad at her, and she's just, you know, she says that she's happy that the girls got away this so that they can awkward, destroy him. Very awkward angle to act at. Well, yeah. And honestly, it makes you realize that, you know, clothing, they use this, I'm pretty sure the exact same shirt and sweater and pants that old Gail had been wearing, mm-hmm. or young Gail, and you can just really tell that it does not suit her at all. No, it like, really doesn't. It's, it, it's baggy in all the wrong places. Yeah. So... She's happy the girls got away so that they can destroy him. And he's like, you've forgotten. I know, I know where, where they were going. going. And then yeah. he just turns Gail into ash. Yeah. So once again, I feel bad for whoever owns the And then she's gotta go the catch them all. Jesus Christ. You're welcome. I don't know Pokemon, but I get that reference and it's just funny enough. Anyway, so. We come back to Gail's house and somehow the girls have walked all the way there and are walking up this extremely long driveway. Yeah, like we pan over to see them walking up. We get some chatter about them leaving the car behind. And then we get to the meat of the conversation mm-hmm. during a lovely and, walk and talk. And we get to see that the, the house is on a nice hill and you can see like the palm trees and there's like some fog in the background. Mm-hmm. It's it's a very scenic mm-hmm. spot. It's lovely. Yeah, so we learn that Piper doesn't want her powers back because she thinks that not being a witch anymore will just solve all of her problems. And Prue's like, well, you know, I get it. I didn't want to be a witch anymore when Andy died. But Piper's like, no, it's not the same thing. Yeah, and it isn't because, you know, this isn't a something bad happened to you and so you don't want to be a witch. This is the the reason my problem. Yeah. Like the reason that, that things are are happening to me in this way is because I'm a witch. Mm -hmm. So neither Phoebe nor Prue understand why Piper feels this way. And we end the scene by Piper just walking off screen and we fade into black to go to commercial break. We are getting a lot of really great blue breathing sounds. Yeah. This week. Yeah. He's being, going to be interesting. Very loud today. Yeah. Yeah. So when we come back from the commercial break, we get yet another exterior shot of Gail's house. And we cut inside, and Piper is working on this lovely, like, brass gold sort of rotary phone with yeah, these white cups. it was so ornate. It was very, like, old lady phone. Yeah. Like, old rich lady phone. Yeah, and I'm assuming that she was, like, calling a cab but or something. But then Phoebe, like, pounds down on the hook in the middle and hangs it up. Yeah, and we get a sisterly conversation where Piper tries to convince them that not having their powers means they can go back to having normal lives. But Phoebe's like, honey, we were born this way. Yeah, in like, yes. and like, we, we can't, can't just not be witches. witches. But Prue reminds her that none of them can go back to just pretending they aren't witches and they need to accept the fact that they are. Mm -hmm. Piper walks around this lovely sitting area and she's like, I don't want to end up like Gail all alone in a big old fucking house. Yeah. I'm just like, what is wrong with that? I know, right? I mean, other than like having way too much fucking room. Well, there is that. Way too much fucking room. There is that. But her sisters, of course. And honestly, I would upgrade that kitchen. Well that's a story for another day. Yeah. So her sisters, of course, assure her. We talk a lot about upgrading kitchens, don't we? Well, yeah. Kitchens are awesome. Kitchens are important. It's where you make the food. Indeed. And the food is important because it's how you live the life. Indeed. And life is important because it's how you pet the dogs. (laughs) Life needs things to live. Anyway. (laughs) Thank you, Percy. Okay. Her sisters assure her that she isn't going to become like Gail and just be a spinster in the house and whatever. And there's there's a lovely, but, like, two-way hug. Yeah. And Phoebe's like, so please 
Can please? we please get all powers please, please, back? Please, please, please. Yep. They and, all, and like, Piper laughs a little. Yeah. They they decide, okay, fine. And they, they all hug. And then we get a quick insert shot of Kryto, like, staring at the building before we see the girls walking down the stairs to the basement. Piper wants to know how they know that Kryto will come back to the house. And, and Prue's, Prue's like, like it's going to be the, the first place he looks. I, I mean, come on. on. <laughs> Piper puts the tea on the table, and they wonder how they're going to get him to drink it. And there's plenty left. Yeah. Prue says that they just have to get him to use the one power that he hasn't used yet, meaning astral projection, and get him into two places at once. Because, of course, she knows that the body is vulnerable when you're astral projecting. Mm -hmm. So let's make that happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Piper agrees to do it with the caveat that if she dies, she's going to haunt the both of them forever. Forever. Yeah, it was very funny. Phoebe hands Prue the spell, and we hear Kryto calling for them upstairs. Yes, because we see him, like, walk in, and he's like, you know, I know you're here, that sort of thing. He's like, anyone home, I know you're here, and I know where you are. And I'm just like... Then why did you say anyone home? Yeah, I know, dude. Yeah. Come on. Like, come on. Of course, again, the the unlocked door. Yeah, well... Kryto then walks toward the basement, and Phoebe comes out from behind him. and Like, like she found an alcove next to the... Like, inside it the kind, door. It actually reminded me a little bit of the episode where she got possessed by the woogie. Yeah, a little bit. Because, like, she just came out from fucking nowhere right yeah. there. She came Again. out of a shadow. She learned something from the woogie. Yeah. So, she kicks him down the stairs with a lovely hi And he falls down, and then, subsequently, <laughs> Prue and Piper push like a wine rack over on him yeah it was like this weird like shelving unit thing it looked like it was for wine because it had the x's and stuff. yeah it was either for wine or for scrolls yeah yeah you know and prue yells to phoebe to get the potion so, so phoebe, phoebe runs off Crito crawls out from under the shelves and makes prue and piper fly because they like do the the feint of trying to get in front of him to go up the stairs yeah and he makes them fly back into the back of the basement yeah they land on the ground really hard and we cut to phoebe upstairs who is standing against a wall she yells out that she like goes under the stairs to go up to the second floor yeah like she yells out that she's got the potion and we cut back and forth between prue in the basement and phoebe upstairs with prue calling for the potion and phoebe telling them to start the spell and they're because they're trying to get crito to after project and mm-hmm. try and be in both places yeah so prue and piper start to say the spell and after, and after like a, a little bit yeah it was like Krito, a single couplet yeah crito's body not only goes limp his head goes down he just fucking falls to the floor yeah which like prue never did Right, but I'm thinking that's because he doesn't really know how to use the power very much. He wasn't expecting it, so well, I'm okay with it. Well, even the first time Prue did that, she didn't collapse. She just, like, went a little comatose. But I think the first time she did it was she was in a chair. She was in a chair, but she still had, like, her arms on the armrest and everything. Yeah. And she didn't, like, fall out of the chair. She didn't go completely limp. She, sure. Her head just went down. And sure. she, like, had a sigh. Or actually, no, she had an inhale. Yeah. But anyway, whatever. he falls so, to the ground. Prue tells Piper to get a potion. And, and then, then we cut to Phoebe and Kryto upstairs, and she gets him in the throat and then kicks him, yells at her sisters to do it, and we cut back down to the basement where Prue opens Kryto's mouth and Piper, like, starts to pour the potion in and, and Prue's just like, give him all of it, which I thought was very funny. So she just starts pouring and it's like the most sloppy pour I have ever seen. It's like And we going... don't even see the actor like swallow or anything. Yeah, like it's just falling out of his mouth. It's going all over his face. It was hilarious. But she's basically trying to get as much of it down his throat as possible. Oh yeah. Cut back to Phoebe. She sees him as he's like on the floor, like kind of reverse astral project. Yeah, so she yells that he's coming back and he goes back to his body. And we cut back down to the basement again as Phoebe is now coming down the stairs. The girls then say the full spell. Their powers float out of Kryto and back to them because they are the charmed ones and they only need a few seconds for it to work. Uh huh. Piper has a cute little callback moment to earlier where she gets that like joyous, mischievous look on her face. She goes, Want to see what does freeze? And then she freezes him. Yeah. And then Phoebe says the reverse spell, which is what witch is done and then undone. Yes, Return this spell and back within. And separate him from his skin. Which is a weird rhyming scheme. Yeah. Kryto unfreezes, and we get the color version of his premonition, where yeah. he, like, glows orange and red, bulges, and you see the stitches come out, and then he just fucking explodes. Yeah, he gets, like, separated from his skin, and 
Boom! Oh, yeah. Lovely, lovely explosion of skin bits. Mm -hmm. Phoebe says, it looked like that hurt, and they hope it did. Yeah, they say that, that it's payback for Aunt Gail and Helen and Amanda. Mm -hmm. You know. And then we get a quick shot of the three dudes from, from the gas before. station. All the three two, old guys. The, for some reason, the two in the convertible are back at the gas station. And the old guy is walking out of the gas station. Yeah. Even though they had all been in completely separate it's, places. It's like reverting them back to their normal age. Kind of brought them back them to in, where they were. In the world. Like, weird. Yeah. It was very, very mm -hmm. odd. Yeah. And then we have a lovely exterior night shot of the manor. So we know it's like the next day or mm -hmm. later that night or whatever. The girls are sitting at the cafe table. Phoebe is now in like a golden shirt with like blue spaghetti straps and a blue beaded necklace. We don't see what she's wearing underneath that. Prue is in a blue spaghetti strap top that was just all blue. But mm -hmm. again, we don't see anything underneath that. And Piper is in all black. But that's all we can really see at this mm. point. This time, Prue's hair is down. Phoebe's hair is pulled up into multiple little fun buns. Mm -hmm. And Piper's hair is pulled back into a bun that's in a bun cage. It and has I like, love a good bun cage. It has like rhinestones on the very back. It is so cute and I want one. <laughs> It is really adorable. I miss a bun cage. Like, out of all of the things, like, I love the leather hair wraps. I really have to find mine. I know that it's got a purple rose on it. Mm. I, I, I think I know where it is. I love the, the leather hair wrap. But I love a bun cage. Yeah. Because it's literally, like, you don't need a hair tie. You just have this little thing. You pull your hair up so that, it, like, in a bun, you stick this, literally, it's, it's a little metal cage that you stick mm -hmm. over, and then you have a little stick that just pfft, straight on through it. Or sometimes you can just bobby pin it. Yeah. But it's just, it's nice. It keeps everything in place. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely thing. And I love a good bun cage. Yep. I need to get another bun cage. Mm -hmm. I miss my, I used to have one that was like really ornate looking. I don't know where it is. But I, I used to have one. one of those like trendy 90s metal things that would like turn into a flower and you could like unfold it and make yeah. it into like a tube and shit. Yeah. You could use those as a bun cage. Uh -huh. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, Prue so. and Phoebe have given Piper a brand spanking new pair of tan work hiking boots, yeah. sans demon blood, and they're like, do we need to budget for more shoes as a kind of euphemistic way to ask her if she's still into being a witch? Yeah. And so Piper, we get a lovely heartfelt scene where Piper says that she'll be a witch as long as her sisters want to be witches, even though she still feels like she wants to have a normal life. And we get Phoebe going, well, I'm always going to want to be a witch. And like, then Prue's like, oh, she's young. Yeah, it was kind of funny. And so, then, so Phoebe smacks Prue on the arm, and Prue smacks her right fucking back harder. Yeah, it was cute. <laughs> and then Piper goes to leave to talk to Dan. And Phoebe turns to Prue, asking if they should worry about Piper quitting. And then she pulls out her glasses. And Prue is like, you little liar, you already saw the optometrist. Yeah. And Phoebe's like, well, let's just say I'm not as worried about my vanity anymore. And she puts on her adorable, adorable glasses again. Yes. Now, this would be a great place to end the episode. Like it this, would. This looked like it would have been a lovely place to just end it right there because it was the callback line of, I'm not so concerned about my vanity anymore, putting on the glasses, and we could have faded to black and gone into credits. But However, no, we have to get the extremely awkward semi closure yeah. of Piper breaking up with Dan. We get some night shots of the buildings behind the Oakland Bay Bridge and an exterior shot of P3. It's very like low angle. Yeah, it's a very, very low in. angle shot. We can see a very small line of people going in. There's no now appearing sign and no secondary P3 sign. Ah. Uh. Yeah. And then... And so, now here's where my watching on Netflix was very funny. Oh, yeah. Because we see, inside, we see people in the club dancing very fast to a slow song. Yeah, the DVD version was a bit faster, but also, none of these people are dancing in the same rhythm. Like, if they're looking yeah, at each no, other, they they're in the do. same rhythm as their partners, but... But nobody... Because the way these are shot, it's all silent because you can't hear people making noise. They're right. just supposed to move their mouths and make it look like they're at a club doing club things. Yeah. But really, if you hear this before editing, it's just the funniest thing. Yeah, it's hilarious, though, because watching on Netflix, it was a very slow song. Yeah. And they're all just like this, like, happy dancing, whatever. And I'm like, I don't know what the what. Yeah. The what. So, but you said it was like a faster song? Faster song on DVA, yeah. Okay. We, because I didn't watch it on DVD, I didn't look it up, and Kendra doesn't do any research, so, you know. Well, I did a little Shazam this time, but not really. Yeah. Not really. 
it doesn't really matter. It really anyway. doesn't. So anyway. we pan over to see Piper and Dan sitting on the couch in the little VIP section behind the red curtain thing. And fun fact, for this entire sequence, you hear sometimes hear the lyrics of the original song on the DVD floating in, and they mesh surprisingly well, almost hilariously well, with the conversation that is happening. I did not bother to write down what the lyrics were, because I am me, but it was very appropriate. I just need you guys to know that fact. So, this is a rarity where I am doing research as we are doing the podcast. Apparently, the song is by a band called Catatonia. The song is called Valerian, and it is... (laughs) Didn't that movie just come out? Yes, apparently. And the best part is that it is apparently from the album Equally Cursed and Blessed. So the entirety of this is highly appropriate. And yeah, the lyrics are something about like, and yeah, she'll go as he goes. Like, kind of, it, it feels, the lyrics feel highly appropriate to a breakup. Yeah. For me. So I will put a link to the YouTube video on the website. I oh my God, guys. The first like... At least four the first, comments. yeah. At least the first four comments on the YouTube video are, are all, are about, all Charmed. about Charmed. It's very funny. Yeah, the second one is just Piper and Dan exclamation point. Yeah. <laughs> so I will put a link to the YouTube video on the website. I apologize for not having any idea about anything. If I find anything else out about this band, I will put that up there as well. Mm-hmm. But you know, don't hold me to that. Yeah. Okay. So anyway. Anyway. And we see now, because we see them sitting down, that Piper's black shirt has been paired with a red skirt. Mm -hmm. And Dan is in black pants with a, like, mustard yellow top. It looks so bad. It was so gross looking. Because not only is it not good for his complexion, it did not pair well with his even greasier hair. Yeah, it was not. Holy fuck. It was not good. But, so we get a very lovely scene, which I'm going to condense very thoroughly. Essentially, Piper is breaking up with Dan, and about halfway through her beginning of the explanation behind why she's breaking up with him, he he's realizes just like, that he that he's, he's like, being broken up with. Yeah, like yeah. I'm I'm gonna let you just understand that I get where you're going, and we don't have to do this entire fucking thing. Yeah, right we don't now. need to be awkward. So let's he, just although not he be does make it awkward by asking if is it's it about, about Leo? Leo. Yeah, and she like looks down in a way, and he's like, "I did. It's none of my business." Yeah, but the it so, goes extremely well. Yeah, so he he basically, like, she lets him know that she needs to try to make things work with Leo, and he does. He takes it immensely well. Honestly, her posture in this scene is making it look like she's got a bit of a humpback. (laughs) Yeah, she is a little, like, like stooped over a little. It's just like she's curled in on herself, and she's at a weird angle that makes her shoulder bleed look like it's in the middle of her back. Yeah, it was a little weird, it, but, yeah, you know, whatever. Anyway. Anyway, so he says that they'll still be neighbors. She says they better be more than that, I'm meaning like, that I hope. Don't fucking say that. Well, but I'm, I'm assuming it was a, like, I hope we'll still be friends kind of thing, not just neighbors. And he kisses her on the forehead, and then he grabs his leather jacket, and he walks off. And we end the episode on a shot of Piper looking very <laughs> sullen on no, the couch he by herself. No, walks off on the lyric, yeah, he'll go. Well, there it's you hilarious. go. There you go. So, we end with the lovely shot of Piper looking sullen on the couch, all by herself, Uh and we go to the end credits. So now we're done with this episode. So now I have a logistical question about this whole getting younger thing. You're old, right? So you're either, you either still have a job or you're retired, Mm -hmm. right? So you might be able to, like, drain your bank accounts and have cash, but you no longer have legal identification, so how do you live life? Like, you can't get a new job, so how do you make money? You forget, Crito was last in operation in the 16th century before anyone had picture IDs. No, no, I get that. I'm not talking about when he did this to begin with. I'm talking about now. Yes. Like, if you were in, like, your 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever, and you go back to being in your 20s, your ID is no longer you because you look nothing like that anymore. You can still get your your money out of the bank because you have your debit cards and whatever and and anybody can use your card as long as they know the PIN so you can use your own stuff and get your money out and that's not a problem. But how do you live your life? Because once you deplete your savings and your, your checking account, how do you make more money without any legal identification? This is why this storyline could not happen in the digital age. Yeah. However, in the late 90s, early aughts, perfectly reasonable because... 
you know, you don't have social media, so like but, I, I can I can understand well, like it's a little easier. More things are on paper, filing mistakes can happen more likely. So it's a little easier for stuff like identity theft to kind of happen because, you know, maybe you go to the DMV and like to have some finagling or some shit. Like, okay, but see here. Maybe the- maybe you go into the DMV and say, Hey, for whatever reason, this error happened on my driver's license where it says for some odd reason that my birth date is like 40 years before I was actually born. Like, I can see finagling happen because like maybe they're not on entirely computer systems. Yeah, I still Stuff don't buy it. Stuff is a lot easier with computer systems. I still that you don't can buy coordinate it. Better. But like this really couldn't happen today. Really yeah, no, today. No. It could have happened like in the 90s. I can see it being a little more possible, but not fucking today. Yeah, no. Because then also, like, most applications are online now. So, like, they have to have your social security and won't work without it. Right. I just have this thought of, like, okay, let's say you have $1,000 in the bank. Let's say you have $10,000 in the bank. There's only so long that you can live on that before you have to make more money. And how do you do that? And the only way to think about it is you become basically an illegal alien. You work under the table. Like, you work for cash. Well, okay. I can see how Gail could survive, though, because she's already retired. So presumably she's got a pension that's just coming every month. She can obviously afford to keep that house. The only problem are her medical bills. And now that she's young and healthy, she doesn't have to deal with those anymore. Right, but so that's still an expense have... off the table. Right, but she'd still have to pay for the ones that she had. Seeing that house, I don't see that as being a huge problem. Also, remember, the issue was not that she has medical bills. The issue is that her medical bills indicate that she is on death's door. Yes, very true. So... Her Medicare is obviously fucking taking care of it. Yeah. And once she stops going to the doctor, I would assume as long as she pays whatever, like, meager balance is left on those bills, she's fine. You can do that by mail. Yeah. I don't know. I just have assume they have her card on file. I assume she's the rich sort of person that in this era would have a card. Yeah. Because that was not as common back then. Yeah. I just, it was just like that logistical thing of like, okay, you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever, and you go back to being in your 20s. How do you live? Like, what do you do? Because now you're young and healthy and you only have the money that you got. Mm -hmm. And that's just, I don't know. It was just a logistical thing that hit my head and wouldn't go away. Also, this would have been before Google. So anyone trying to do research on a person can't go to the internet and see photos of what they look like. Like, we are constantly doing with this show. Very true. So, as long as she still has her own signature, Mm -hmm. and she can get some random, like, old friend to pose as her, she could possibly, like, do a switcheroo where she requests a fake birth certificate for new her. Maybe. Like, clearly I think about this fucking too much. Yeah. But yeah. That's right. I could see it happening back then. Not now, is my point. Yeah. It was just a thought that hit my head and wouldn't go away. And I was Mm -hmm. just like, oh, okay. But Mm -hmm. whatever. Anyway, so with the episode done, we are at our ratings portion of the day. Mm -hmm. So would you like to go first? I'm going to give this a 7.5 out of 10 roadmap squiggles. Alrighty then. (laughs) Blue cookers. Thank you, Blue. And I am giving it 8 out of 10 bun cages. I love a good bun cage. What can I say? You really do. I really do. You really fucking do. Yeah. And I do not have a favorite outfit. I do, however, have a least favorite outfit. And it is what Piper is wearing at the beginning. God damn it, Piper. Stop wearing those fake turtleneck thingies. Yeah, well, you know. For me, the outfits, I enjoy Prue's outfit that she wore. I think this is two episodes in a row, isn't it? With the turtlenecky things? Yeah. The weird high neck short sleeve thing. Because there was the blue one that looked way too fucking thick. And then this one. Yeah, I don't know. Why, wardrobe, why? Hey, you know, what can you do? Anyway, for me, I like the outfit that Prue wore, the tan jacket, white shirt, black pants. It was very classy. Mm-hmm. Like It wasn't exactly a tan jacket. It was kind of like it a, was like a, a button, button down. Yeah, it was like a button down shirt. But it was very classy. It was a very nice outfit. Like, had she worn that to Buckland's, I'd have been like, yeah, that she could get away with that. But she never did. Like, it was a bit casual for Buckland's, but it's much better than her standard. Exactly. For Piper, I liked the final outfit mostly because of the bun gauge in her hair. And for Phoebe, I liked the butterfly shirt from the start of the show. That was cute. Yeah. Especially with the fun buns. Yes. So there you go. That is episode 217, Done and Dusted. 
So we are on to social media stuff. You can find us, as per always, at charmchats.com, where you will find all of the links, and maybe eventually someday there will be pictures again. <laughs> we'll see. You can email us any questions, comments, queries, or comments at charmchats at gmail.com. Indeed. Remembering that we record our podcast on Sundays, so you can always send us any comments that you have, any questions that you have, anything that you would like to mention about a an episode in the future and we will always go back and check our emails and uh -huh. you know like we are coming up on the end of season two so if you want to start sending us stuff about season three go for it yeah we will we will always you know read our email we read our email every sunday sometimes i'll check it during the middle of the week just to check yeah but yeah so don't hesitate even if you just want to send us a note saying hey you know you were wrong about this thing i'm good with that too we might not get to it for a couple of episodes down the line since we record a few in advance. But, you know, we will always mention it if we get an email from somebody who is awesome enough to be listening to our podcast. Oh, yeah. Does. Yeah. So you can also tweet us. We are on Twitter at Charm Chats Pod. And the same on Tumblr. Indeed. And I will always be the one to look at that. And if if you send us anything, I will respond as quickly as I can. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're pretty good about responding. Yeah. Well, it comes straight to my phone, so this is it's, true. it's quite easy to respond to. And again, you can find us on Facebook, where you can also message us there, and we will respond as quickly as possible. I'm usually a little slower about Facebook, because that doesn't come directly to my phone. But, you know, I try. You can find us on Instagram, where there are always fun, cute little pictures of blue. Oh, that's, yes. That's usually what's up there. Oh, many cute pictures of you. Yep, those are both under Charm Chats. And, of course, you can support us and help us get even better by going to patreon.com slash charm chats and supporting us there. Just becoming a patron, even at the $1 tier. We thank all of our patron supporters because without them, we would not have been able to afford the website again this year. Oh, yeah. So thank you so much for that. And you can always... Give us a rating and review on iTunes if that's where you're listening to us because that helps other people find us as well. So until next time, sleep tight. Don't let the warlocks bite. Bye. 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 Baby, Piper and Pooh, they've got evil to slay and some potions to brew. So we'll see where it's at this week with Kendra and Kat.